<laughs> Let's go. So yes. it's a very pleasure to for having you here. Professor Canuto, please, uh, you have the floor to open our seminar, the post-pandemic world, the global transformation and challenges for development. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Canuto. Thank you, Amazio. Uh, so good morning to everyone. <clears throat> I have to thank you for inviting me for this opening. I'm very pleased to be part of this, so to say, ceremony. It's gratifying, it's very gratifying to see you all, to see that you are doing well. Everyone looks very fine on my screen at least. So good morning to all of you. <laughs> I'd like to congratulate Professor Amancio Jorge de Oliveira for taking this along. I have to say good morning to Professor Janino Nuki, the director of the Institute for International Relations. I congratulate all the organizers and the distinguished speakers. I have seen a very good list of speakers, so I foresee that this is going to be a very nice meeting. <clears throat> So I think this is a rather interesting and important topic, <clears throat> relevant certainly, and very timely. So I was looking at the program and I see that some very, very important questions are going to be discussed. It's very likely that at this moment, we have probably more questions than answers. But of course, it's very important for make the to make these discussions. It's important to discuss. <clears throat> I have seen the program. I have seen some very distinguished participants. <clears throat> and uh, I'm very pleased to see that these topics are going to be discussed. Personally, I see clearly the importance of collaboration in every aspect. We have learned many things on these pandemic times and probably one of them that uh, touched me most was the importance of breaking barriers, geographic barriers, and uh, <clears throat> have collaboration between countries. <clears throat> Sorry. I was reading an article recently that was pointing out that uh, in spite of the political tension between the United States and China, the number of publications has increased during this time, showing the importance of having global solution to global problems. So there is global demands, and I think we have to break some barriers to increase scientific collaboration. And I think of this in a very wide perspective. It somehow bothers me the fact that our publications, scientific publications are going into a direction that's not very friendly when you look at the uh, open science. And I think that the scientific knowledge has to be shared in a more, in a more generous way. So I mentioned this just to say that I think that the global problems require global collaboration and I'm very pleased to see that these topics are going to be touched here. So thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much to have the opportunity to see you all. Have a wonderful meeting. And uh, thanks for inviting me again. Thank you very much and congratulations to you all. Thank you. <clears throat> thank, thank, thank you, Professor, for, for coming and for uh, opening this discussion. Uh, so I pass the, the, the floor to Professor Ari Plonsky. Uh, good morning uh, to everybody. Uh, I would first like to say hello to our provost for research, Professor Silvio Canuto. Uh, Professor Silvio Canuto just mentioned uh, the importance of uh, collaboration. And uh, uh, I think it's uh, uh, worthwhile to mention that uh, his uh, deeds go where his mouth and his thoughts are, because this seminar, this international seminar with a beautiful program, as he mentioned, 
is a fruit of his idea of uh, putting a little bit of resources, a really a small amount of resources in order to bring together uh, uh, centers uh, at the university connected to the provost of research that deal with uh, specific subjects. Uh, in this case, uh, five centers uh, joined efforts and uh, uh, this was a result of this uh, policy of uh, breaking walls and building bridges, not only as a university with external environment, but also inside the university. Uh, and so we have now uh, five of these centers uh, working uh, together to establish a seminar. And uh, Professor Amansi was a catalyzer of this effort in, in, among our five groups. He heads the Center for International Negotiations. CAENI is the acronym in Portuguese. Uh, we have uh, the Brazil Europe Observatory of Science and Technology, uh, headed by Professor Moacir Martucci. Uh, we have the Center for International Relations uh, Research, headed by uh, Professor Rafael Villa, NUPRI is the acronym in Portuguese. We have the Research Center on Public Policy, uh, headed by Professor Elizabeth Bobashevsky. Uh, all of them will be part of the program during the uh, our journey. Uh, Professor, uh, the center is now part of the Institute of Advanced Studies. Professor Elizabeth is also the deputy uh, coordinate, uh, president of the, our research commission inside the Institute for Advanced Studies. And the fifth center is the Center for uh, po uh, technology policy and management, uh, PGT is the acronym in Portuguese, and uh, uh, yours truly is uh, the research director of this center. So these five centers, uh, inspired by this motivation that Professor Canuto expressed of working together, uh, which, which has also the emotional influence of the pandemics, uh, uh, devised the seminar and so I would like to see to say as a, one of the members uh, or, or at least uh, responsible for one of the centers, what a pleasure it is to work together, how much more we can do if we are working together than if we are doing things only by ourselves. And hope obviously, as Professor Konuto mentioned, that this message will also be uh, uh, present in other uh, fora. Uh, I have also a second position that is uh, as a Dean Director of the Institute for, uh, of Advanced Studies of the University of Sao Paulo, and we were very happy to uh, receive these uh, five uh, uh, centers and uh, use the infrastructure of uh, the Institute to help uh, uh, provide the adequate conditions for having this international seminar. Uh, and uh, I just would like to mention that, as Professor Konuto also said, uh, the subject uh, chosen for today is very timely. The program is, uh, uh, has to do with the spirit of these days. And just to uh, give you a concrete uh, connection, uh, we have in the Institute uh, a very, uh, I think, academic, but also very popular uh, 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 magazine, which is called... Uh, 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 advanced Studies uh, uh, magazine or journal, whatever you want to call it in Portuguese, Revista Estudos Avançados, uh, which has some five to six million downloads uh, every year. Uh, it's it's an acad academic journal, but written in, uh, let's say, more accessible language to people that are not uh, uh, of the uh, specific tribe. So for people that are educated, but have a general interest, you can uh, read articles uh, more uh, loosely. And uh, we were, happy, were very happy that we reached uh, now in December, the number 100. It's a 100th edition. And in this 100th edition, besides commemorating also 100 years of uh, uh, two important Brazilian intellectuals, Celso Furtado, economist, and Floristan Fernandes, uh, social scientist, and 100 years of the death of Weber and 250 years of the 
uh, as a key figure in the arts, which is Ludwig van Beethoven, we have also uh, articles, the main subject is uh, impact of the pandemics. And uh, one of the articles, and I'll finish by mentioning this, has to do with one of the topics of today's uh, 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 seminar, which is uh, a global value chain uh, reconfiguration post uh, pandemics, written by two colleagues, Professor Alfonso Fleury from the Industrial Engineering Department of the Polytechnic School and Professor Maria Teresa Leni Fleury from the Business School. Uh, they both are very uh, known uh, 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 scholars in this area. So I would say that, uh, again, we have uh, uh, these two events uh, merging or two groups merging, the five centers and the Institute of Advanced Studies, but we are uh, in the same line of thought. And uh, I would like to finish thanking all the participants of the seminar. Uh, for agreeing to be part of it, uh, thanking my colleagues of the other four uh, centers and uh, wishing that we have a fruitful day with results. And uh, I pass the ball back to Professor Amancio. Words. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. Go ahead. I would like to greet Professor Silvio Ascioli Canuto, Provost for Research of the University of Sao Paulo, and Professor Guilherme Ariplonski, Dean of the Institute of Advanced Studies, partners in this initiative. Uh, I, uh, I also would like to welcome to everyone in this opening session. Uh, we are uh, approaching the end of a hard year, difficult for all of us researchers, the government and the population. Uh, we are experiencing a pandemic that has affected all areas and everyone. Therefore, it's very timely to hold the seminar, the post-pandemic world, global transformations and challenges for development at this moment. Throughout this year, since we started the isolation, the University of Sao Paulo was able to maintain all teaching and academic activities remotely and has been advancing in important researchers contributing to society in a very effective way. The seminar is one of the contributions uh, the university is offering, and it aims to help us reflect and discuss solutions to continue the cooperation so important today. Finally, I would like to congratulate all the coordinators of the research centers that organized this seminar uh, with special guests. And Welcome everyone and hope you all enjoy the seminar. Thank you. Thank you, Amancio. You, you can no, move no to Professor uh, Rafael Villa, right? So please, Professor Rafael. Good morning uh, and good afternoon, um, everyone. I am the Professor uh, Rafael Villa from the University of Sao Paulo. Welcome everybody uh, to this event that uh, we'll be discussing today the post pandemic uh, world transformation and challenging for development. Our first panel will discuss the reconfiguration of the global knowledge production network. And for this discussion, we'll have two important a researcher of this problem, a Professor Jean-Pierre Bourguignon from European Research Council in Ademar Seabra eh, Cruz, Brazilian Ministry of Foreign eh, Affairs. Uh, the, the order of the presentation eh, will be the first play uh, Professor uh, Jean-Pierre, Jean and after that, uh, Ademar. Uh, before uh, to give the floor to the Professor Jean-Pierre, I'm going to read some curricular information from the Professor uh, Jean-Pierre. Uh, Professor uh, Jean-Pierre Bourguignon, 
uh, is mathematician of origin. Uh, currently, is interim director of European Research Council of the European uh, Commission. He, wo he was the president of the European Research Council from January 2014 until December 2019. Uh, prior to that, he was the director of the Institute de Audit Estudet Scientificate uh, uh, from 1994 to uh, 2013. Uh, he also held a, pro a professor position at a college, Polytechnic, from uh, 1986 to 2012. Professor Barguignon for the University of Sao Paulo uh, is an honor to have your presence in this event. We'll have, uh, you will have uh, about 30, 30 minutes for your presentation. Thank you again, Professor. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Professor Jean-Pierre, he's have some, some problem to getting the, the fifth and so let's start with uh, Dr. Ademar, uh, Ademar Seabra. Uh, Rafael, let's let's change the order, please. Okay, uh, so I'm going to read. Huh? Um, mm -hmm. Thank you, Ademar. Uh, uh, Abraham, huh? um, and my my friend, <laughs> my friend for about <laughs> 30, 30 years, <laughs> thirty years ago, <laughs> only. <laughs> um, oh, 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 Ademar, no. Huh? Uh, 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 he is, uh, uh, among other many distinctions, he is uh, currently a member of the Brazilian Foreign Services of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, he has master de degree in philosophy by the London School of Economic and Political Science. He has master in political science from the University of Brasilia and PhD uh, doctorate in sociology from the University of Sao Paulo. He teach in research in international politics, globalization and international relation theory. Uh, he uh, was a lecturer in several uh, countries like uh, United States, Canadian, uh, Peru, uh, 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 among others. Uh, Ademar, thank you very much for your participation in, in this event and for the University of Sao Paulo. Huh? Uh, um, we are very thank you for you uh, participation. Thank you. Uh, uh, three, uh, about 30, 30 minutes, Ademar. That's right, yes. With great pleasure, Rafael, thank you so much. As Rafael very rightly said, we are very good friends for uh, decades. I won't tell how much, how much uh, but that we, how long we have been together. And I uh, also present my, my acknowledgements and gratitude uh, to Professor Silvio Canuto, to Professor Guilherme Plonsky and Professor Janine. I'm very honored, very flattered and delighted to be with you here. And also would like to mention also uh, the presence of other very good friends and professors, Massimo Martucci, Amancio, and, uh, and Professor Isabel Pobachevsky. Those are the ones with whom I had uh, contact this morning by this video conference. Uh, I, I, will, I will use uh, my uh, about uh, 30 minutes. Uh, in fact, the first thing that comes up to our mind when we speak about COVID, and this is, I think it's a very important uh, way to start, is to, uh, to emphasize the, uh, the great ethical imperative that the pandemics has imposed to humankind and to, to countries and to civilization itself. It's an ethic imperative 
that has not been, of course, responded uh, with all the strength, the energy, and the coordination that we would like to, uh, to have. But on the other hand, I think it showed, I think, humanity as well in a very great moment in terms of uh, solidarity values, uh, the homage that has been paid around the world to frontline workers. So this is a kind of demonstration that, uh, that uh, globalization and the ideal of uh, putting uh, people and uh, nations and civilizations and institutions together, they, uh, even though very uh, imper imperfectly, but this ethical ideal and this ethical imperative, it was uh, in the forefront of the mobilization of, uh, of the world society, of, uh, of world civil society uh, to curb and to fight against the pandemics. Uh, having said that, I will not, uh, the topic of this panel, as uh, Rafael also mentioned, is the reconfiguration of global knowledge production networks. Uh, I, would, I would understand this for a kind of um, a non conventional angle. I will not talk. Uh, uh, what I'm not, what I'm not talk, going to talk about, for instance, is the, the overall uh, scientific or innovation or academic mobilization uh, to fight and to curb all the, the consequences and the results of the pandemic upon uh, several realms of life, be it the health factor, of course, the health factor, the, um, uh, the, the, fact, the economics, uh, economic factor, political implications. So I'm not going to talk about this, about consequences and about a uh, more uh, descriptive framework of uh, COVID in the international, uh, international, in the contemporary political and economic arena. But I'll rather, uh, ha I'll, I'll divide my, my presentation in three, uh, three, three factors, in three blocks, I could say like this. And the, the underlying discussion about, uh, uh, that, that's, that is uh, below, uh, all that's going to be said during my presentation is the emphasis in the structural factors which overlay the COVID out outbreak, how it affected the world. So, and this is to say that COVID in itself and uh, the pandemics, uh, they are not going to have uh, the structural effects. They're not going to transform the international world order. So it's a much more conservative approach that we will adopt in this regard, uh, not expecting that COVID will have a uh, very big impact or very big transformative, uh, uh, transformative uh, movements or strengths in the international system, a a as in comparison with other important episodes of uh, of international history, of uh, or of even human history in the uh, in the in the past decades and past century, this past decade. So, of course, there will be uh, implications and there will be impacts, but will be of a much more limited nature. So, I'll delve into these structural factors first. The second thing uh, I will mention uh, what we call uh, how what what, what is uh, when we talk about this transformative impact and these structural transformations of, uh, of the world international scene. It has other factors which not uh, COVID. I will talk about COVID and the pandemics more of a consequence of underlying causes and the consequences of other structural factors which were underlying. And the most important of them in a more focused way uh, will be what I would call uh, the primitive uh, phase of uh, high technology growth in the in humankind in the past uh, few years, or, uh, the primitive that was back, say, in the 80s, and the more recent, which is the accelerated or the exponential phase of high tech growth and the advent of uh, giant uh, technology technology monopolies. So, uh, of course, this has to do with uh, all the problems and questions of misinformation, of information dealing with COVID, uh, the, spread of, uh, the spread of this type of information, scientific knowledge and research, which everything is underlying, and how this correlates with this exponential growth of knowledge and this exponential concentration of power within few firms. And uh, finally, I will talk about the threats posed by these monopolies and uh, perhaps what could be the only, uh, the sole long-term action possible to curb the power and influence of those, uh, of those uh, um, multinational firms, those, uh, those businesses and the impact that they have. And there is a very good message of hope that I'll try to bring at the end, which is the, the greatly enhanced role of human sciences, of political science uh, in the realm of, uh, of research and the realm of bringing uh, new, uh, say, concepts 
and explanations and processes and uh, for uh, for uh, understanding uh, the world scene uh, after the after the pandemics. So, as regards the the first the first topic, these structural factors which I mentioned, uh, uh, what I would, I would defend is that COVID does not represent uh, an impact in the international system. When we, of course, when we talk about international system, we are talking about uh, say uh, uh, catastrophes, catastrophes not in the ethical or say uh, or the journalistic sense, but more in the in sense of physics, study of physics. The catastrophe, some elements that transform entirely a reality. So this we had, of course, after the war, 1949, uh, 1945. We had in 18, uh, 1989, after the end of the Cold War, the end of bipolarism, bipolarism when uh, Francis Fukuyama very say, uh, precipitously uh, declared, decreed the end of history. And at the same time, COVID will also have, I think, very little influence in the international order in itself. So this is another thing, order and system, so the international order we are talking about, say, the emergence of China. This, I think, perhaps is the most important feature of the 1989 uh, international system. So, of course, the emergence of system, uh, the emergence of China relates to all it, the power it has amassed since the mid-80s. Uh, nowadays, the, this uh, over enormous influence that the country has in all realms of the political system. Uh, just mentioned something, the the discussions about new uh, trade routes into the Arctic, um, the sheer amount of Chinese investment all around the globe, and particularly Latin America and Europe and Africa, the tens of millions of Chinese workers and uh, skilled workers and professionals who are around the world as well uh, to carry on uh, a new reality of, uh, of economic power that is going to be to, is going to lead to political power at, uh, at the same time. So those great uh, transformations, uh, they are much above in structural and uh, international sociology terms than COVID itself, which is more, I would say, of a conjunct conjunctural or more of a contingent uh, issue of the international system rather than uh, rather than a structural or necessary feature of uh, big global transformations. So what are the pre-existing trends before COVID? Let's try to come back uh, some months before COVID. Let's come back to 2019 and try to understand the world in 2019 and the world in 2020. Of course, the impression that we have is that we have undergone huge transformations. Of course, everybody of us has been more time in, in, at home, have been secluded, we have been uh, we have uh, now faced uh, more than a million, 1.3 million people who died because of a pandemic. So this could be, nothing could be so more severe, more dramatic and more heartbreaking than this sort of things. But in terms of, this, of the characteristics of the system, we could say that they remain more or less the same. So we had, before that, a kind of, uh, of the, world, the world power of the United States with the politics of isolationism and unilateralism which is, uh, I could even say, that's much uh, a kind of feature of uh, Republican administrations in the U.S. When we think about the Bush, the George Bush administration from 2001 to 2008, it's basically the same thing. It was even more uh, isolationist. It was even more unilateralism uh, in, in many, many aspects. So it's a different and uh, uh, aspect that we're going to see when compared to last decade. But this is the, the key reality of the stance of the biggest, so the most important international actor in the system, which is the United States. We have also the emergence in the last year that could be observed. It is being observed today, of course, but this is detached from the pandemics, the idea of identity politics and the, the movement of deglobalization. We, uh, lots of people, lots of uh, many societies and countries around the world, they uh, understood and seen that there were some excesses that, that globalization was going too far. I remember that uh, back in the beginning of the, the century, 2001 and 2002, uh, there was a British foreign secretary who said that the, we are facing the end of the nation state as such and the end of uh, the end of uh, a national loyalties or fidelities and this sort of thing. So it was a kind of, uh, of a discussion and, and conceptual uh, framework that is very, very strong. And then we had, of course, the black backlash of that with identity politics, with nationalism, uh, with uh, xenophobia and the globalization of other, of other aspects which correlates to that. The New World Trade Order, of course, it was something that uh, we were seeing uh, uh, in the past few years. 
uh, with the, the assault and the, the quest for uh, WTO maintenance. The rivalries, the extended rivalries between the United States and China, the, the problems with uh, China and European Union, trade, uh, trade uh, difficulties and the uh, trade uh, crisis between the United States, Mexico and Canada in the reconfiguration of the, the, the ancient NAFTA agreement. And um, so this has, has seen as a reaction to hyper-globalization that was going too fast in the past decade. So uh, the corollary, and, and, and another corollary, corollary that we could also spot is that the United States was losing a competitive uh, edge to China and to the Asia-Pacific country. So this is another tenet of the system. Uh, we see that China had an emergency in, nano, in nanotechnology, in biotechnology, information technology that were rapidly uh, closing the gap, catching up with the United States and even surpassing the United States in this regard. Another feature, the restrictions on migrations and the unskilled labor force, and the advent and the sheer utter expansion of, of digital economy, the, the, of the economy of uh, 4.0, and uh, the uptake of the big tech giants in the world uh, economic and the entrepreneurial scene. So the, the pandemics in this regard, when we talk about COVID, we, we have to understand it. Uh, COVID, much more as uh, not, not, not precisely a cause of change in the system. So COVID is not going to change as the system in itself or, uh, or, or, or the international order, but it's rather than a consequence of the flaws of the, the limits of articulation and coordination of the system. Uh, I, I remember a very nice text. It was, in fact, a kind of uh, a press article published in the, in the Washington Post by Daniel Bell, the famous sociologist. He published uh, an article called uh, Previewing Planet Earth in 2013 and had a very striking sentence that has everything to do with the, the, the current COVID, COVID pandemic, which is that the nation state has become too big for the small things and too small for the big things. So what we're talking about this is the inability of the nation state alone to deal with uh, unconventional non-state non or what we call the non-Westphalian uh, global, uh, global threats. And the pandemic, of course, is the greatest of all these challenges that we are facing today. So the structural factor is how the system would have to, to be coordinated to face this challenge and not uh, to fight the consequences. So of course, we are, we are fighting the consequences in a medical, in a research, in a scientific way. Of course, this is precisely what we have to do. But in terms of uh, of uh, make of being prepared for the advent of certain things, of course, it has to underlay a sort of political coordination that we're lacking precisely because of the if globalization had gone too far in the past, the uh, the anti globalization movement. Or, uh, or the, uh, it, of course, it, it prevented uh, the coordination to, which was necessary to fight the pandemics at this uh, this point. So, uh, what we we can say about COVID is that will intensify, it will strengthen certain pre-existence uh, trends and the rivalries. So, it will have an impact, of course, in the in financial uh, in financial markets. Uh, in financial processes, in trade, production, so perhaps the international division of labor will not change that much, but on the, on the contrary, to reinforce the actual international division of labor, innovation. So this topic will be, I think, better dealt with by uh, Luis Casanova and Otaviano Canuto at the last panel of this journey. But what, just one example to sell, to take, to, to uh, illustrate what I uh, want to say, is that pandemics, for instance, uh, did pandemics have an effect uh, which effect had in wealth concentration around the globe, for instance. Uh, the the pre-existence trend, the pre-existence trend in 2019, 2018, and before was the concentration of wealth and income among the nations, the, the increase of disparities among these nations, and uh, the concentration of wealth and power in certain individuals. So what the pandemics did was precisely the concentration of this wealth among countries and individuals. So it didn't change the correlation of economic power in the world. So uh, we have, for instance, uh, some examples, and Brazil has a negative example that we are going to fall in the GDP scale. So we're falling from the seventh, eighth global economy to perhaps 12 or 11. On the other hand, we did some. We had some good opportunity that we took. Uh, we took well uh, advantage of. 
which is Brazil was the only country among the G20 countries that had uh, export surpluses during the pandemics. So, but this, those are not say, systemic. Those are not necessary factors defining the world order uh, during and after the pandemics. These are contingent factors. So the, 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 the sanitary crisis impacted contingently uh, or conditionally, not structurally, the global supply chains, for instance. So the pre-existing factors will, will, will prevail. Uh, other, other uh, we could say that, for instance, the 2008 uh, financial crisis had a very big impact as well, perhaps even a bigger impact in certain aspects. Uh, we remember, for instance, when we attribute uh, the process of Brexit in 2016, the referendum, uh, we would consider that the, the referendum was largely a consequence of the, the regulatory or the lack of regula regulatory uh, framework mass that was created in financial markets, in real estate markets at that time. And uh, we remember when uh, the first year of the Obama administration in 2009, that we had to, uh, a, a big intervention in the huge uh, automobile firms at that moment, uh, like GM, banks to uh, warrant credits. And, um, and, and, and uh, in comparison, now we are having, of course, a very severe second wave of the pandemics. But the economy, we are seeing signs that the economy is recovering in many of realms, and uh, vaccines are going to be become readily uh, available. And uh, some some uh, omens or bad predictions that the the global supply chains would be uh, totally destructured. We I have saw many of debates and read texts about this that will be global destructuration uh, in the structuring of uh, of supply chains of production lines. Of, uh, of industry. So this had this happened, but in a limited, within a certain, say, a systemic framework that did not change uh, so much. And it also had some advantages. Of course, COVID brought advantages to productivity, for instance. Productivity levels, even though we had a higher, much higher level of unemployment, but on the other hand, productivity levels enhanced it tremendously. For the things that we are doing right now uh, among ourselves, which is working from home, uh, and uh, we are uh, we are all in, in highly digitalized and service economies. When we imagine, for instance, a, an economy such as Britain, the United Kingdom is considered to be a wayless economy because it's more than 90% of GDP services. So in a very service, knowledge-based, research and development-based uh, uh, economy, so these factors, the service factors and digital economy, of course, will represent a much higher gain in productivity, but other other economies which rely uh, less in services and more in primary goods and more in commodities, of course, they will be less productive. They will not take the advantages or the or the optimal points that the pandemics could could supply. So this is uh, just to finish this point. It's nothing like when we're not living. Nothing like 19, 1929, uh, a, new, a new deal in the 30s in the United States. We're not living a Marshall Plan. We're not leaving the economic crisis that Latin America had in the 80s with the with the default in Brazil and Mexico. Uh, with uh, the, well, Brazil nowadays, we have more than four hundred billion dollars in uh, international reserves. And at that, that time, in the 80s, for instance, uh, what we had was uh, zero reserve. Reserves were considered to be uh, a secret of the state because we didn't have any at that time. And uh, even 2008. So. What is common about the what? But what is the commonalities of the world system in these past episodes as compared to today? When you talk about 1929, Marshall Plan, 98, 2008, all what is related is that the center of gravity of the world economy was in the Atlantic, and nowadays we're seeing during the pandemic times, but again, pan pandemics is just a contingency, is much more uh, going to the uh, Asia Pacific direction. So. Um, uh, we uh, we could say that these current changes, economic changes, tra uh, trends that the pandemic has imposed to us, they have been uh, that that's pandemic's a consequence, have been uh, shaped in the mid '80s when we have all this uh, transformation of production. The '80s were much more important in this regard. So we have this disconnection of material-based production and the knowledge-based production, disconnected the disconnection of labor work and and. Uh, in industrial work and the disconnection of uh, financial markets to trade. So there were huge disconnections in this, and this uh, generated a revolution in terms of the wealth of nations, in terms of the competitiveness, in which 
Brazil and most of Latin America. Sadly, we lost our momentum and we lost our chance in the 80s, whereas precisely the Asia-Pacific countries, they were considered to be the newly industrialized countries, the newly uh, medium income economies that rapidly industrialized at that time. And, uh, and, and this was what would say the primitive phase of the, the fourth industrial revolution in the 80s. And now, more recently, we are, we are living under the, the accelerated, the exponential phase of this fourth industrial revolution, which is embedded in the strategy of the five or six big tech giants, which are uh, taking over the whole of the world market in the, in the digital, digital economies. So, um, what, what, of course, this, uh, the, the characteristics of monopoly is, uh, is not only not only pertain to, uh, to big tech uh, giants or big tech monopolies, but also we could say this in the aerospace uh, sector. We just have seen the bids that uh, Boeing is trying to, to do to uh, to swallow Embraer or the big pharma industry. Now the, the the fight for the new vaccine, which is amazing, less than a year we're now counting on vaccine. This is just exposing the enormous fight between the very few pharma industries which they concentrate an enormous amount of tens of billions of dollars of R&D. And, uh, of course, automobile energy. So it's a, it's a characteristic of a tendency of, of uh, monopolistic economy, which is underlying uh, the reality that we're uh, seeing right now. So this poses to us a challenge, which is to understand. So in covid and the pandemics reinforced this. Uh, it uh, reinforced the urgency of understanding the role and the power of the nation state, the limits of this power uh, in times of accelerated structural change and concentration. So what we are going to see right now is, uh, what we are seeing right now, is threat, is threat to consumers and threat to individual rights. I think that these threats to individual rights, they are the true nature of the title of the span, the reconfiguration of knowledge um, production networks. They have to do precisely what the, the political impacts that those who have uh, those who have in the in the upcoming in the upcoming times. So uh, let, let, let's consider this structural change and the big tech monopolies from a different angle to begin uh, this uh, one of this third phase of my my presentation. So we had uh, very important issues in the in the recent history of humankind. Uh, we, we think about the, the Arab Spring in Northern Africa and the Middle East. Uh, we talk about some factors that happened in Brazil, like the impeachment of Dilma Rousseff, the election of Bolsonaro, Brexit in itself. So we, we know that the enormous impact that the circulation of information, of misinformation, of uh, digital technologies, algorithms, uh, artificial intelligence, so all of these are big novelties in the political process. There are many, some politicians, they were very able and apt to take advantage of this, uh, this acceleration, acceleration or exponential uh, phase of the fourth industrial revolution, and they took it to their own advantage in the political process, others not. So we, we are precisely leaving this transition, and this, of course, poses uh, the, the challenge of the state, how the state uh, must do, can do, uh, to tackle uh, this, uh, this amazing uh, concentration of power uh, of the of the new tech giants. So, did the pandemics have any effect on elections? For instance, recent elections in the United States and uh, in Brazil. I, I would dare to say that not at all. Pandemics had zero effect in those elections. How could you say that? Well, because it's not the pandemics that had a political effect. Of course, Brazil had huge abstention rates, etc. But it was the way that politicians deal or dealt with the pandemics is what mattered in those elections, not the pandemic itself. So it's a different approach because it shows us what's really at stake when we deal, uh, when we, we try to analyze and decompose and to uh, divide and better understand uh, the impact of pandemics in the current social uh, reality. So there has been many attempts to curb big tech the technologies. I refer to the work that, uh, for instance, Professor Marcelo Martucci in Brazil, Europe Institute, we have this... Uh, there's a general data protection regulation from the European, the European Union, uh, Germany with the fake news, uh, criminalizing fake news, uh, EU, United European Union private laws, antitrust laws in the United States, uh, trying to break up the, com the companies, uh, regula uh, regulatory uh, issues. 
But we know that this is very, very difficult. This is almost impossible to do. So just to understand if you try to break the companies, to break a company like Facebook and much smaller ones and try to avoid this huge monopolization of a circulation of uh, social uh, personal contacts. So, of course, there will be uh, there, there will be a baby Facebook will come up in, at the end of the day, and uh, somebody will invent in Germany a Freund Buch, uh, a book of friends, something like this. So, and this will uh, grow exponentially again. So, uh, we we try to we are trying to close the gate so to avoid that these concentrate powers. But the elephant, as we say, has already escaped. So we cannot close something which is already there. And uh, the reality is that the more uh, data, the more data a company has, the easier it is to generate more revenue and even larger amount of that. So we understand that we, just to see that Facebook swallowed and bought Instagram and Facebook, uh, we have uh, we have this uh, this startups, all all the startups that which really do the innovation for the big tech firms. They are bought and they are swallowed before they can become real competitors. So this is the structural challenge that has to do with the with the certain political aspects that I'll just touch before I finish it. But of course, uh, we, we are, as consumers, we are absolutely delighted with this reality. We are delighted and we are very satisfied because it's, it, it's amazing that in a few years, everybody has free phone calls, everybody has free searches, everybody has free emails, Everybody has free navigating uh, episodes. So the amount of wealth, the amount of productivity, the amount of advantage it has brought is uh, is absolutely amazing. But this, of course, cannot be cannot hamper our understanding of the the challenges that we have to face uh, uh, due to this. Uh, to this Just to exemplify the challenges, when we have a, a search, or as you put. The Barbie doll, the Barbie doll for girls that you would like, or not only for girls, but the Barbie doll that you bought, that you tried to search in Google some 20 years ago, the order in which appeared was first uh, who paid the advertiser who paid more. Afterwards, some 10 years later, the order of the searches was, was a kind of voting system among uh, all that made the searches. So you had something like the not Barbie anymore, but ideals Barbie. So the feminist movement started to appear using the same keyword Barbie. Nowadays, we don't have either of them. The result will depend on who you are, your preferences, your choices, your inclinations, your dispositions. Uh, so everything that's about you, that the companies they know, uh, an enormous, a vast amount of data, a vast amount of knowledge, and precisely what we're talking right now, everything is being recorded, is being kept, is being amassed, this big data, transformed into algorithms and analyzed through internet artificial intelligence mechanisms. So this is an enormous amount of power, sheer amount of power, and of course, democracy and uh, and freedom and uh, the values and practices of uh, our, our, our political values cannot depend on the on the wellness or on the good intentions of those who are in charge of this. So this is precise. We are living in a in a, in a, in a world of precision publicity, uh, the substitution of the invisible hand of the market by the digital manipulative hand of the tech giants. So this is as if this, those tech giants they were nowadays they had a kind of God's God's power of knowing everything about everyone. So this is or as uh, an articulist from uh, the Financial Times, uh, Isabella Kaminsky once said, we're living under the, the Ghost Plan 2.0 from the, uh, from the former Soviet Union, or a kind of ghost public sphere, uh, which, is, uh, which poses this threat to citizens and to individual rights. Of course, this is not news. We remember, of course, uh, the, the, the global television manipulation in 1989 uh, elections, the power of Televisa in Mexico, uh, what Robert, the power of Robert Murdoch? Uh, uh, okay, I'm just finishing. That's right. Uh, in uh, in Fox News and the uh, Wall Street Journal, but this uh, it's a different uh, aspect whatsoever. Uh, the, the final word that I would like to bring is that uh, global network productions uh, they will depend. I think that the only factor that will be about that will be affected to curb this power is uh, an enormous and decisive investment that everybody in the world, but precisely our countries, and this I'm, I'm responding to the, to the title, the development, uh, the, the challenges for development, is of course the investment in education. And when we are investing in education at the school, in basic, uh, fundamental, 
education. We have to teach uh, children and citizens how to deal with power and misinformation. So what has to be taught? What, what is the characteristics of the modern post-pandemic educational system? The ones that bring values of tolerance, of pluralism, of rights to dissent, of free responsible speech, individual rights and duties, solidarity, duty of respect to others, uh, consent, and even etiquette. So it, it is, those are values that cannot uh, bring up, being uh, brought about by education system. So this is the sole way that we have to enhance our integration of uh, knowledge networks in a in a civilized and uh, democratic way in the future. Thank you very much, Rafael. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ademar, uh, for your important uh, and challenging uh, communication. And now I'm going to give the floor to Professor Jean-Pierre uh, from um, a, a European Research uh, Council. Professor uh, Jean-Pierre, you welcome to the University of Sao Paulo, and it's an honor uh, to have you in the event. Uh, you have a question for about 30 minutes, uh, 30 minutes. Show. Thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity to exchange on, on this topic of uh, the reconfiguration of the global knowledge uh, production network. Um, I, the point of view I would like to introduce actually can be easily connected to what uh, Mr. Sarabar just said about the important role of education. But I will leave this for, for the second part of what I want to say. The first part, uh, I really want to as a scientist, I'm a mathematician, uh, to, to really look at, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, what has been happening and uh, also what has not been happening. So I think they are the two things I want to, to stress, because for me, the main message, which I will try to explain, is in the sense that, of course, we are facing a quite extraordinary crisis, which is a completely world crisis uh, for which we don't really know yet the end. Uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, really a number of key patterns of the organization of the research at the world level or even at national level uh, really um, shows that uh, some of the features in place uh, really uh, were able to show their strength and their value. So let me start by uh, saying things which have changed and which in a sense, uh, I think some of them will be with us uh, for some time and for good reasons. Uh, part of them are really also connected to the fact that uh, some facilities like the one I'm using now to connect to you in Brazil uh, using uh, Zoom or any kind of software of this nature, of course was already available before, but now it has become common use. And uh, actually, this is one of the features which uh, definitely, um, as uh, and for a number of people, it was not a choice. It was just they were not allowed to. That was happened in France that we had really a severe lockdown and were presently in a not completely severe lockdown, but a serious one. And and for the moment, for example, I'm. Uh, in an interim uh, function, the uh, president of the European Research Council, but I'm still in Orsay, I'm not in Brussels. And uh, previously, when I was the president, I was, of course, living in Brussels. I'm not anymore living in Brussels. I'm just living in Orsay, but I'm having meetings all the day. So the first point was really this technology has made it possible for many, many more people, not only in the research um, world, but also in the company world, to consider um, teleworking as an option. And of course, to what extent this is good or not good needs to be evaluated, because for sure some things can happen, like the conference we are having today, uh, which is definitely a great thing. I must say that thanks to the nice invitation I got from uh, FAPESP, I've been following a few of your conferences, which I enjoyed very much. So, so clearly this is something we gain, that is the naturality to consider that conferences happening anywhere in the world are worth being looked into and considered as something to do. So that's uh, the first uh, change I wanted to mention. But the other one, which I personally 
uh, also was confronted with, which was, of course, connected to the uh, pandemic and uh, what uh, the challenge that it poses to society. So it was at a time where I was not in my fun present function. I was still just a, a retired scientist. And then I was really um, asked by uh, friends or people I knew to take part in some kind of working groups. Uh, some were more connected on, uh, on biology or I would say epidemiology altogether. Some others were more directly mathematical, had to do with the modeling. And some others were quite different, but they were just uh, connected to people I knew were much more in economics. So on none of these topics, except maybe the mathematical one, was I really directly uh, a competent person, but people ap appreciated uh, to have me as uh, listening, as criticizing, and as contributing to the discussion. And maybe this is a, a, a new dimension that people have understood. That is, uh, of course, uh, many, for it's not a new feature to claim that interdisciplinarity is very important. But then all of a sudden, people realized how critical it is and it, how it has to be nurtured. And part of the way you nurture multidisciplinarity is by having people truly from different backgrounds to to listen to each other, because the first step is definitely for people to understand each other. And very often the same words have the different meanings in the different contexts. So this can only be done through some kind of a step-by-step -step approach in which people start to really understand each other better, can ask questions and so on. The other side uh, also, which was very important, uh, was um, um, uh, in, in this uh, context was also um, the, the key point of having people from outside to ask questions, which we know in the context of pluridisciplinarity is a very critical thing. The, the vision and the uh, understanding and the approach taken by people with different backgrounds tend to be quite different. And uh, having this confrontation is very often extremely important to focus on what is the real question and not sometimes the a fake question that people believe is the heart of the matter when it is not the heart of the matter. And sometimes people coming from outside help you a lot to really identify what is the heart of the matter. So this is one of the changes I could see that it, it was, it became natural or easier or more, um, uh, more welcome that people with different backgrounds started to talk to each other in a quite open way. And part of it was, of course, that a number of issues to be dealt with in connection with the pandemic were really of a, well, not of a new nature for many of them, but the, um, really the extent to which they were coming was very different. And many people really were looking for, um, of course, first of all, treatment. And it's one thing which I personally find quite remarkable after all these huge efforts by many different people in different backgrounds, for the moment, basically no real treatment has been found. So it shows that the basic understanding of the process by which uh, really you have vi vi virus really affecting uh, the, the functioning of cells is really still very, very uh, limited. Because if it was not so limited, of course, we would have already a treatment. And that's why the battle for vaccines has become so critical because since we don't have a treatment, the only way is to try to get people develop their own treatment, which is having their, uh, their system, immune, immunity, immunitary system to, to fight the, 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 the virus directly. Without uh, So that's the treatment that people are looking for. That is that your own body is developing its uh, own resistance. And that's why the vaccine has become so, so important. So that's one uh, of the changes I wanted to stress, which is this uh, more um, um, outgoing, more open approach, uh, which has been conducted by many people. One thing I didn't say, which I should have said, of course, a number of people who asked me to participate uh, to, to their discussions where, uh, as I said, people not necessarily from my own field, but there were also people from different countries. Uh, in particular, at, uh, in, in terms of my discussion with economics, it was very, very interesting to see economists, uh, mostly European in this case, uh, discussing and basically having all the same, uh, the same reaction, saying that at the level of uh, data we have at the moment, nobody knows where we are going because the depth of, of the crisis is so big 
that it's totally impossible to make any kind of prediction. So imagine that on the side of the politicians who really have to make the decisions, having uh, been in this situation where it's so difficult to make predictions is, is, is terrible. So that was one of the things I wanted to show about the change. The other thing about the change, which I want to, to, to stress, is also uh, for, for science, it was uh, at the same time a fantastic opportunity, but also a fantastic challenge to, be, to have some of the fundamental mechanisms of science being scrutinized and being uh, really presented to a very wide group of people in the population. And of course, this is not frequent because very often science or research is considered as a very specialized field, working uh, very far away from uh, citizens and, and therefore. But then, and, and as I said, for, for the best and the worst, uh, this happened that people really wanted to understand uh, the process by which uh, new knowledge was created. And uh, in particular, in this very specific context, for example, uh, whether a treatment is available, how do you test whether a treatment is, uh, is a, of a good quality, and what is the process by which you create uh, new vaccines. And from that point of view, I think, uh, so this was something for sure new at such a scale. And of course, this happened not in a totally neutral environment, because at the same time, we know that a lot of uh, fake news have been started to circulate uh, at, with an intensity which, of course, was, uh, I mean, really uh, destabilizing, uh, even in some cases, but also at the same time, some uh, completely crazy theories uh, about possible uh, really uh, complots de developing everywhere and so on. So what is the, uh, about this new feature, which is really, I mean, was connected, uh, connected to the completely world scale of the crisis, uh, what, what, is, uh, what is the outcome? Well, in a sense, it was a, a fantastic opportunity for scientists to, to make the, what is really their, their profession, which is to apply the scientific method and to make it really understood and better understood. And I must say, from that point of view, I'm not sure, uh, as a, collectively, as a community, we did a great job. I'm afraid that, uh, for example, uh, you know, in science, uh, doubt is uh, really so fundamental in the in the um, in, in the scientific method. But uh, of course, doubt is is a method in itself, and it's not just something to challenge anything on any ground. It, it means that it's uh, some kind of, some kind of a systematic and really organized way of challenging uh, statements. And uh, the other thing, which is also extremely important in the scientific method, is to be based on facts, and at the same time to really organize and collect facts. And uh, I must say that uh, the pressure, which uh, of course uh, the media altogether put on the scientific community, led also to actually what I personally consider very serious misbehavior, that is scientists who want to uh, really be uh, very visible rather than being modest and really in their corners. And, and, uh, and therefore, that was um, for sure something which, uh, um, I mean, there have been some bad examples in the sense given by some uh, scientists uh, when actually this should not have happened because I think it's uh, part of the, uh, I mean, for me at least, uh, definition of a good scientist is somebody who should be always self-critical and also modest about his or her own contribution. But at the same time, another thing which uh, for the scientific method is uh, extremely important is also the, the importance of time. And of course, uh, because of the crisis we were facing, uh, time was, uh, was really uh, running out in a sense. That is, people wanted to have uh, extremely quick solutions. And we know uh, that uh, a number of uh, um, things which are organized in the way uh, science is uh, contributing to society are, are really organized in a way which really give to time a, a certain value. And what do I mean by this? Well, uh, first of all, we know how important, and this will be my transition with my second point, which is uh, what I think, um, what the crisis gave us as opportunity to check that our method was not so bad. But for example, in terms of uh, 
of the vaccine. We know that the processes by which there are trials, first on small groups of people, then a wider group of people, and, and so on and so forth, uh, of course, under the pressure of, of the depth of the crisis, there was really a, a lot of... Uh, 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 the pressure was so huge that people tried to really get steps done more quickly than usual. And I'm afraid um, I understand why this was happening, and I respect that. But on the other hand, I'm not sure it's, it's a good idea. Because uh, at the same time, um, of course, uh, we, it, 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 it proved that we could do some things more quickly than you, we usually did them. But at the same time, the, the reason why there were all these different levels of uh, trials was not just a bureaucratic decision. It was based on the need for, for the work to be done in the proper way and to be done uh, really in a way which uh, allows you to gather the appropriate information and to really, uh, you know, statistics are uh, reliable if they are done on a wide and, and large enough uh, samples. So if your sample is small, what you get as information is still very partial information. That's why you have to do tests uh, in the, I mean, really in the broader context, but also in a more varied context so, so that you can really um, identify some possible short, um, I mean, really uh, shortcomings of, of the solution you hope you have found. So I think uh, one thing we, uh, we learn from this is... Um, in this uh, kind of a um, uh, world size experiment on uh, confrontation of the scientific community with the population that um, for sure, I think some, uh, it was an extraordinary opportunity to get science better understood. And um, I'm not sure we, we did so, so well from that point of view, except for me, and then I'm touching again with what uh, Mr. Siabra just said, how it made uh, really evident how critical it is that the scientific method is understood at the very basic education. And for this, I think, uh, means not just uh, people learning by hard things, but being confronted with how one does a real experiment, how one does um, establish a fact, uh, and so on and so forth. And I must say that in many countries, and my own country, France, uh, is, in, is among them. Uh, the tendency in recent years uh, has really been to, to really, in a sense, uh, limit um, science to being just a, a list of things to know. And what I'm trying to explain, that it's absolutely critical that science is not just something to know, uh, but it's also something to, to experiment with, to be confronted with, with the method that establishes science as a solid um, body of knowledge. And I think uh, this uh, need for this uh, very, very solid uh, basis uh, really forces us to think back in terms of uh, what is the goal of education. Goal of education is not just people uh, really um, amassing uh, big quantities of uh, knowledge, uh, in particular because we know now today that uh, knowledge can be very easily accessible, provided you can assure that this knowledge is certified. So the question of certification, the question of being able by yourself to be critical has become very, very central. So let me move to my second point, which is in a sense, what, uh, in, in what sense does the, the present crisis and what we had to go through is actually um, uh, really proof that what was in place uh, was, was uh, quite uh, relevant. Um, one of the, so I already touched uh, upon this because I think um, we, uh, part of my, uh, what I said before was the uh, fantastic importance of, um, of the scientific method and, and the need to make it really uh, much more, uh, much better understood, much more respected, and, and really, in particular, a very key part of basic education. Well, the example I would like to give is, is the one of uh, the institution I'm in charge of at the moment, which is the European Research Council. So just very briefly, it's a, it's a program of the European Commission, which uh, supports researchers, mostly uh, uh, researchers coming to us with individual projects. And so at this moment, we are very close to having funded 10,000 such uh, researchers. Uh, the ERC was created in 2007. 
And I think uh, it has been doing a good job. I mean, really, um, the projects we receive and the projects we fund tend to be very ambitious and, and very um, also uh, high risk, high gain projects. So people know that when they come to ERC or supported, um, it, it has become uh, really a seal of quality because definitely scientific quality is the only criteria on which we make our selection. And we are very, um, we are very proud that we convinced a, a number of researchers from all around the world to participate in the evaluation of our projects. So what do I? So this is the the project I'm talking about. So of course, when the crisis came about, I mean, when the pandemic uh, appeared, one of the key questions was. Um, well, do we have in our portfolio that is based on decision where, of course, the pandemic was not part of the landscape? Do we have uh, projects which are relevant for the pandemic? And so the people in the, in the agency managing the, the program looked uh, into what they had in store. I mean, the, so typically the number of projects which are presently active is about 5,000 projects. So it's a significant uh, uh, significant number, but at the same time, uh, one of the key features of uh, ERC, uh, European Research Council, is the fact that we are really touching all fields. So we are including social science humanities, so we are really uh, covering uh, many, many different areas. And the outcome of this search was that um, actually the number of projects which were really directly relevant to the pandemic was typically 183, almost 200. And actually, uh, it's very interesting if you, we actually produce, uh, I mean, published a brochure on this, um, just to explain um, uh, that uh, really the, the program was uh, really producing relevant research uh, for, for the pandemic. And uh, the amount of money which goes with that is quite significant, about 300 million euros. So it's, uh, it's uh, even more than that. So it's a very significant amount of money. And uh, the variety of approaches taken by people uh, was considerable. So uh, what is also interesting in, the, in, this, um, in this description of the projects uh, that the ERC has been uh, considering is, uh, is really that uh, we are touching many aspects. Some of them, of course, are directly connected to the biology, to the medicine, uh, to, the, uh, to the really the uh, epidem epidemiology, but also to the social impact, uh, how the, I mean, how the, the impact on the social life, um, also what kind of uh, instruments can be used in terms of uh, the physics instrument, uh, what kind of, uh, of um, really um, organization can be relevant uh, to to do with this uh, to deal with the pandemic and so on so my point in bringing this up is to show that uh, the what has been for the whole history of ERC our really main motto which is to deal with frontier research that is uh, just to be completely bottom up at the initiative of researchers but at the same time and not only uh, doing that, but uh, also uh, let, letting research come to us with an ambitious project, basically uh, led by their curiosity, uh, was actually irrelevant. And actually, um, uh, because we believe that really what makes a difference is when we are able to understand uh, new uh, situations, uh, and develop new concepts which prove to be relevant, and, and therefore, so that's why I'm putting this in the category of the proof that the system is working uh, in the sense that uh, we, it's very important that any research system keeps a, a significant part of its activity totally open and led to, to the uh, initiative of researchers because uh, that's the good way of uh, really anticipating what will happen in the future. And uh, nobody knows what the next crisis will be, uh, what it will be its nature, and, and therefore it's uh, extremely important. Okay. The other part which um, I really want to, to defend also, which again, uh, uh, I touched it a little bit, but has been also challenged. You, you saw that because of the pressure, uh, the, the time pressure on uh, delivering quickly uh, solutions or uh, new information or uh, headlines, uh, there was really a huge pressure for the 
system of validating articles, which tended to be really challenged. And in, in fact, we, we saw some announcement made actually uh, at, at the moment where uh, the, the, the results were just um, being written and, and really being submitted to a journal. And though it shows, I think for me, how much the process by which we validate uh, really is, is fundamental. It does mean that the way it is done is perfect. And actually, we saw some uh, some flows. We saw some uh, weaknesses. And, and um, of course, that's always the, what happens when you are under very severe scrutiny. Usually, you can see things that you don't see in a regular moment. But still, I think it, it shows that this approach of having a really critical reading of uh, publications is very, very important. And actually, this, is, this touches on, on something which, of course, the new means of communication, uh, electronic ones, uh, of course, they made it so easy to um, actually um, uh, disseminate uh, results. But uh, what is very, very important is that the results that you access and to which you spend time to absorb them are worth them. And, and therefore, um, the, the fact that uh, you need to have the literature properly uh, scrutinized and properly um, really uh, filtered uh, is, uh, is, of course, very important. The key point is to make these filters uh, not biased, to make these filters uh, at the same time efficient, and also, uh, in particular, in these times of crisis, uh, one quality which is requested from the filters, they should not be too slow. And uh, so this is, of course, a, a very big, a big challenge. And as scientists, we all know that we have uh, we are solicited to give opinions on articles. And uh, of course, it's uh, at the same time a very exciting uh, opportunity because you read new stuff. But at the same time, you also always have to be uh, doing your job as evaluators, namely to, to be uh, critical of what you receive. So altogether, the other point I, I want to make is also the fact that the number of um, laboratories, but also organizations, and I'm coming again to the organization I'm in charge of at the moment, also showed a, a capacity which actually they had, but they had not necessarily used as much as they should have, which is flexibility. Because I think it was proved in these uh, very challenging times that one thing which was very, very important, that people should be able to, to show uh, flexibility in the way they were developing research. Uh, I also mentioned already in my previous, uh, in the previous part of my speech, how much it was important to be open to new collaborations or new exchanges. And, and of course, this uh, flexibility, the example I want to give for ERC is that we, uh, the ERC immediately mentioned to researchers funded by ERC, that if they saw a possibility of adapting their projects to make them closer to uh, really the pandemic, uh, the agency would be willing to consider such a, an amendment. And, um, and again, everything was done at the initiative of researchers. There was no pressure on them to do that. It was just to re remind them that this possibility exists. And actually, without changing any of our rules, we could uh, actually uh, deal with a number of uh, requests for amendment up to the point that if you look at the year 2020, the number of amendments to research projects which have been granted is twice as big as uh, previous years. And so without changing any of our rules, we, we just showed that flexibility was possible. And again, we followed our basic rule, which was uh, it was strictly at the initiative researchers. And so I, this, just to give another example of uh, the fact that the organization of research um, is, um, had this possibility, uh, maybe it was not fully used in the past, but here under this uh, very special circumstances, uh, it could be used. So from that point of view, I think that was, uh, that was really a, a very good way of proving, um, approving the system, uh, that the system was working. And my last point concerning uh, the fact that the system is good um, is, um, I mean, as, it's, uh, as it is organized now, is able to do a number of things. Um, has to do with the fact that actually, um, although it was extremely challenging, uh, in the case of, uh, again, I'm sorry to stick to 
to my uh, to the um, organization I'm in charge of at the moment, ERC. Uh, really, ERC has been continuing its um, uh, the, its uh, normal job of evaluating uh, applications without any day of delay, in spite of the very challenging circumstances for the staff and for the evaluators. Of course, this meant uh, all meetings uh, became, uh, after the lockdown uh, in March uh, for, for Brussels, um, it meant that all the meetings became uh, virtual, um, and some of them were very challenging. For example, one feature we have, which uh, we consider extremely important, is the fact that for most of our uh, programs, for most of our calls, um, really we do interview uh, the people. And so, of course, doing an interview uh, a priori looks uh, not so challenging. Actually, if you're in charge of uh, organizing the interview, it's very challenging because you need to prove, to be able to prove that the process is fair. So you have to double check the connection beforehand so that you, there is not somebody coming afterwards saying, well, but I was not given the same possibilities as some people have been competing with. And so, uh, and uh, in the case of ERC, the number of interviews which have been performed since uh, the beginning of pandemic is 1,100. So to organize 1,100 interviews is a really challenging thing for the staff because you want to be able to certify that people really had uh, a fair treatment. And so it shows that, uh, of course, stretching a little bit, and of course for the staff it was a immense dedication and a huge amount of work. For the evaluators, we have evaluators uh, everywhere in the world. So some people had for one week meetings during the night because uh, they were in California or in uh, Asia and they were taking part in our uh, evaluations. And our evaluations typically last three days, but of course <laughs> with the process, it's a bit longer. So it tend to become four days or five days. And of course, people working, uh, being up all night uh, was extreme dedication, which you are extremely grateful for. It shows that uh, even the system, I'm not uh, recommending this to become the rule, but it shows that we can uh, really do things and the system has uh, some resilience uh, in, uh, from that point of view. So these were the, the, the points I want to make. And then I would like to conclude uh, this by uh, really a very specific plea uh, that we look very, very carefully into a special segment of the research population, which are the young uh, researchers. Because I think uh, for many of them, they are the ones who are the most sensitive to time. Because many of them have really time uh, employment. Many of them uh, need to finish their PhDs or their uh, certification in a given time. Many of them were not given access to the labs, so it means delays. Sometimes it meant also that some of the tools they were using were not available. And for many of them, uh, actually, it's, uh, it, it was very challenging for um, the countries where the lockdown was in place. Uh, it could mean also if they had children that they had to take care of the children at home. There was no schooling, so they had to do that. And from that point of view, again, uh, it's something which at least at European level is very visible, is the, the, the part of the younger generation of researchers which has been the most affected are actually women because uh, they tend to be more um, involved in taking care of the young kids uh, than the men. And, and from that point of view, the impact on their capacity of doing research has been much more significant. So I think uh, in terms of the organization of the research, probably one of the consequences of the of the pandemic and the, this crisis is that uh, probably a very specific attention has to be given to this uh, group of people because uh, I think the disruption on their lives, on their capacity of doing their job uh, as, is probably more significant than others. And also another point I want to raise, which uh, I think... Uh, is, uh, is also, uh, for me, uh, something uh, which is not so easy to, to actually uh, take, uh, take on board, is that maybe a number of them will decide not to continue in research. So we could also, just by spontaneous personal decision, unless there is a very significant sign to help, um, I think it could lead to really uh, people who uh, de decide to quit, not because they don't have the talent or the passion, 
but because they feel it's just too difficult and uh, that the, pers the perspective or the prospects are, are not uh, clear enough. So I think uh, the responsibility that uh, uh, we have as uh, members of the scientific community, I mean, I feel I have as member of the scientific community and also in charge of a, uh, an agency or just in charge of a, um, really monitoring an agency that we really have to keep in mind this uh, specific problem which uh, could be uh, missed uh, and it could result just in having more people um, actually giving up the, the idea of becoming researchers. These were the points I wanted to make under the, um, after your challenge with the, with the topic that you offered me. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Jean-Pierre, for your interesting um, uh, presentation. And now I'm going to open the floor for the public. And if someone wants to, to make a question, please raise the hand, raise the hand, or require by the chat, please. Mm. Yes, I, I think you raise the, the hand, it's easier system. Okay. So, so if you want to make questions, raise their hand, please. Professor Vera, please. Professors, it was a pleasure to listen to you. Uh, my question is, is the academic system, is the, the more or less uh, how you describe it, ready for a new pandemic? That's it. What is clear from this COVID is that you are open a new box, right? It is because of environment and so on. But look, uh, other, other pandemics, pandemics will happen. And the question is, did we learn enough? Or do you think that if you will have to face another challenge like this, you, you are not being ready to face it? That's it. How the academic will react to this? I, I want to... I had that question uh, following they, Professor Vera. They, they Please, Rafael. Uh, Betty wants to. Okay, go make. ahead. Go ahead, please, Betty. Ah, okay, thank you. It was very interesting uh, presentations. Uh, my, my issue is related to education. Both uh, our speakers taught talk about education and how critical education is for facing the changes made by brought by by the pandemic my think my question is besides critical thinking which is necessary to address misinformation to develop new attitudes and also to understand science i would like to to know about how you think about the what kind of skills education should bring to young people for them to face the new world that are being brought by science, by new technologies and things like that. I'm not thinking about the young people that are going to go to the universities and are going to develop their capabilities to let's say full extent, but I'm thinking about the large number of people, of young people that are not in this track, that are going to leave education, the education track before going into the, into the university. This I think it's very important, especially in developing countries where, where higher education is not so accessible for many, many students. So my question is, what kind of new skills education should try to develop for these people uh, regarding the new facing the new the new challenges? That's it. 
I want to I want to know also following the Professor Betty question if uh, uh, if it, the metrics of evaluation of university should be changed after the pandemic. So uh, some indicators, new indicators, are they should be the same. Thank you. Are so, other question? No, no, no more questions. Uh, so, Ademar, you yeah. respond after this, Professor Jean-Pierre. Yeah, uh, I'll, so I'll first have bring uh, two cents of a discussion for, first of all, uh, uh, Professor Vera's question, uh, which is quite intriguing, and I think it's quite upsetting as well. So uh, her question is if we need uh, another crisis, another pandemic, to see how the scientific community can react to that and uh, how uh, uh, the scientific community is dealing with uh, the, the crisis in the reality which has been posed. Well, one thing we, I said, it is very upsetting uh, because uh, Professor Jean-Pierre Bourguignon he, he brought very interesting points, uh, what I could say about the epistemology of uh, epidemiology and the epistemology of biochemistry. So how we are dealing with in terms of treatment, in terms of prevention, in terms of uh, uh, harmonization, so what are all the features related to the pandemic. What is upsetting uh, is that uh, we have seen that there has been a kind of uh, assault on the, on the principle of axiological neutrality, which has been brought in that very famous work by Max Weber, uh, The Science as Vocation, the Wissenschaft als Beruf, and there precisely this. So we have to face uh, the scientific challenges with distance, using experimentation, using, first of all, the in inductive method and the deductive method. So we all have lots of, uh, in the history of epistemology, we have a consolidated means, consolidated method, scientific method of how to tackle of those problems. And uh, I refer to the problem which has happened with the, the, scientific, uh, the scientific journal Nature in the article that... Uh, possibly were a very faulty and misleading discussion on the treatment of COVID. And uh, the recording what, has upset, stopped. what is upsetting is that the peer review was faulty at that moment. Uh, it, it was faulty. Uh, this this meeting is being recorded. Science is uh, being a gateway to precision. We were expecting that this would uh, help us go some steps further in, in knowledge and not raising confusion, misinformation, division, which was precisely what happened. So in this case, uh, science has an enormous responsibility every time, regardless of the, the, the crisis, regardless of period of, but the problem is that uh, we, we are now not only in a period of crisis, but in a problem in the moment of division. And this is something that perhaps Professor Bourguignon could comment a little bit on how the peers are, are dealing with this uh, this ideal of scientific precision, falsibility, and the traditional scientific method, which has been laid aside in many uh, moments during the pandemic. And as regards to the topic of education, the point is uh, is referring to the how and the the poor student in a school in the periphery of a, of a city in a, in a poor country, for instance, how uh, he or she can deal with the immense amount of information that is available to him or to her. So I think that the great uh, uh, educational tool that we have to, to, to bear right from the, the outset is, uh, of course, the first thing is to enhance the conditions at home. So nobody will be a very good student, even, even if you are in a hypothetical very good student, but with very dramatic conditions at home say, poor parenting, poor interest, poor uh, literation at home, uh, absence of books. So this, this social cognitive aspect at home must be present all the time. And also uh, give reading skills to, uh, to students because reading skills will open up and expand, of course, their tools for understanding what they are, the information that they are being brought about. But of course, certainly, uh, these skills they have to develop at school uh, with uh, with uh, with a view to uh, to to make this is something that has never happened I think, in the history of humankind how uh, how students have to be uh, able to filter 
that the filter and and the filter the bubbles of information that the, that he or she receives every day, and this of course this is critical thinking. But of course it's more beyond critical thinking, even more more serious than critical thinking, because you have of course to have the tools and exercises and and, and how to identify what is real from what is false from what's being propagated, from what has been depicted. So this is something that, of course, is a, is a challenge and it's up, to, of course, to the professional of education. And, uh, and, and that's why I think that the pandemics is bringing uh, very new, uh, fresh new, uh, immense opportunities for dealing with this problem. Thank you, Ademar, Professor Jean-Pierre. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, so concerning these uh, two questions, maybe the first one, which is whether the um, academic uh, circles um, are, put in, are putting enough uh, attention to the lessons learned from the pandemic. I think uh, it depends a little bit. First of all, we are not yet out of the crisis, so there's still some uh, we have to, to be patient. But indeed, I think it's extremely important that people try to really um, really t take the time to uh, analyze uh, in, in, in the sense what the changes which were imposed by the, the, the pandemic, uh, how they have impacted um, relations between people, knowledge acquired by students, and, and also, um, even you see the the knowledge is is uh, of course uh, for for any uh, education system very critical. But um, some of it is much more um, subtle than that, which is also uh, attraction and uh, in a sense, uh, um, uh, well, uh, interest and and so on and so forth. I think for many people, I'm sure probably for you, uh, Mrs. Vera, but also for me, um, I know how much meeting some people made a huge difference in my career. And of course, uh, I could read what the people had written at the produced as scientific result, but actually being able to talk with them face to face uh, actually uh, sometimes really produces uh, a real difference. So one of the um, measure which need to be um, uh, one of the things which need to be measured is uh, exactly. Uh, this lack of personal contact, in which way does that alt, um, change the uh, capacity of people of learning? But at the same time, also their vision and their interest in connecting to, to other people. So I think, uh, in a sense, something you can accept, um, for example, uh, easily if you are dealing with people you know, rather than seeing them face to face, to listen to them on the screen uh, is actually very good. Is, not exactly the same, but still pretty good. But in for people you never met, uh, how can you get your uh, them to know? And so, for example, I've been hearing from uh, university presidents in France the big challenge of uh, newcomers to the university. So how can you make them embedded into the system? Because they have not developed any of the... I mean, the uh, usual uh, reflexes of, of, of students. So how do you really make them part of the system when actually they come completely from outside? It's the same with panels. I mean, in a sense, when panel members know each other, of course, they, they just listening is, is enough. If you have never met somebody, uh, I mean, you have to get uh, some kind of a personal feeling. And this is very global. Uh, this is not just purely analytical. So I think uh, this requires uh, quite some effort. And I hope uh, this effort will be made because it's critical. In particular, because at this moment, uh, maybe I don't, you don't have this in Brazil, but uh, in Europe, we have a big pressure, which I understand, I understand the motivation for people traveling less which uh, I, uh, maybe we were certainly could, could have been traveling too much. But on the other hand, if you, if you just decide that rather than people meeting face to face, they just uh, meet uh, over internet, I'm sure in the end, uh, the result will not be the same. Now concerning education, uh, I think uh, the, the key point, and of course, uh, I mean, uh, there are so many uh, fantastic examples of societies which have been completely transformed by a very high priority given to education. A country I tend to, to always quote for this is South Korea. So South Korea had a very low income 
um, in, of course, after the Korean War, which of course was uh, some disruption. Uh, it was something like uh, $50 per, per year per person, which was uh, not much. And now, of course, South Korea is one of the richest country in the world. And this with no gas, no oil, just uh, absolute priority given to education for 60 years. And uh, transforming radically the, the, the profile of, of, of the country and uh, making people um, becoming uh, engineers, doctors, uh, scientists, and so on. Uh, I think South Korea at the moment, one of the countries in the world where the access to tertiary education is the highest. And, and so, and this transformation was just 60 years. In my field in mathematics, for example, the first PhD in mathematics in South Korea was 1947. So there was no historical tradition. They built it. And now South Korea is one of the significant countries in mathematics worldwide. So you can do this transformation, but you have to be absolutely steady in your effort. So that's about the lengthy investment in education. And, uh, well, which require, of course, uh, I mean, uh, political decisions, but also addition by the population. People feel that being educated is really something which is really worthwhile and should be pursued widely, not just an elite, but the group of people. The next point is really how should the education be changed, in a sense. For me, and I think the pandemic has shown this a lot, in particular in this context where there is so much information available um, uh, on, on, on internet, is of course learning how to ask questions. What are the uh, key questions? What are the questions which make a difference? And uh, why is a statement, uh, uh, why, how can you challenge a statement? How can you check whether a, a statement is true or false? So these are all things for which I think the, the school has to organize itself so that really part of the curriculum is about asking questions in the right way, in a way which could be significant. What makes a difference uh, for many things is whether you have to understood them or not. And to understand is something which is an expensive process. It's not an easy process because you have to come up with a, the right formulation and sometimes coming up with the right formulation is an effort which takes centuries because maybe you ask the wrong question. And, uh, and I mean, physics has been really, uh, I mean, the history of physics is full of situations like this. Uh, history of biology is the same. Uh, the history of many sciences is like this. The people were not asking the right question and therefore they were not, uh, the basis for understanding was not there. So at the level of even elementary school, what it takes to, to, to understand is, is really something uh, very critical. Uh, I mentioned I'm a mathematician, and of course, mathematics is a very good example. Of course, you can, there is uh, some mathematics for which you, you, of course, have to make some uh, efforts of memorizing things because they don't look, uh, uh, in a sense, um, uh, spontaneous to you. But at some point, uh, really, um, the... The, what makes the things uh, easy to memorize if you have understood. And actually, uh, very often, because if you have understood something deeply enough, you don't have to memorize it anymore because it's self-consistent. It has some kind of a strength in itself. So it would be important for me in the uh, elementary education to identify a number of things of this nature which really consolidates each other uh, Part has to do also with language, how language is organized, why is language subtle, um, and uh, which of course is uh, very different from uh, scientific facts. But uh, for me, the, the, the key point with this deluge of information which is available is to be able to sort out what are really the truly important pieces of information. For example, every day we get uh, this huge amount of uh, new information coming from everywhere in the world. What are the sig significant ones? What are the ones which are totally irrelevant, of, of no importance? And uh, this is something which, of course, in the past we didn't have to, uh, to, to worry about. Uh, my father reminded me that he would get uh, in his uh, village, uh, actually not so far from a big city in, uh, in France, but uh, he was getting a newspaper once a week, 
and that was the information he had access to. Uh, he didn't even have access to a radio set. And, and of course, the, the newspaper was read from page one to page eight um, fully, um, uh, line by line. Of course, now it's just the exact opposite situation. We are not starving. We are just being completely uh, put under water by all this amount of information. So how do you teach and really uh, young people to, to really um, come up with a, a, the proper attitude of being really self-criticizing and also still eager to know, but also uh, not eager to know things which are not important. So I think it's a very complicated balance. Uh, I'm not sure there are many, um, many countries which have put this kind of questions at the heart of education. But I think it has become, uh, because it's a big transformation. Normally, access to, to information was very difficult, very painful, very expensive. Today, it's uh, neither painful nor expensive, but it's too much information which actually kills the, the, the valued information. So in a sense, it requires that the education system have to be rethought in a way where this uh, new setting uh, is something uh, people are uh, exposed to and uh, also uh, provided with tools to, to really resist to this uh, deluge. Thank you. Thank you, Professor uh, Jean-Pierre. Uh, well, I think we don't have more time for, for questions, but uh, I thank uh, to Ademar Seabra and Professor Jean Pierre for interesting and challenging uh, presentation. Uh, so I want to I want to finish in this panel and invite for the for the next uh, panel uh, perspective on regional integration uh, in process. Uh, thank you uh, again, uh, Professor Jean-Pierre and Thank you so much, Rafael. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank, you. thank you, professors. So bad so you're in charge right now. Thank you. So um, in this next panel, we are going to address the consequences of the pandemic on trade and on other dimensions that shape the institutional frame for global collaboration. In particular, we aim to evaluate the possible imprints left by the ongoing crisis on regional integration processes. For this evaluation, we brought Professor Ramon Torrentes, Torrent, President of Obreal Global and Vera Thorstein from Getúlio Vargas Foundation, São Paulo. Professor Ramon, uh, Ramon Tor Torrent was, until his retirement in September 20, 2017, a professor of political economy and international uh, political economy and international econo economic law at the Universitat de Barcelona. During his career, he was responsible for many initiatives linking the academic world with the main players shaping regional integration around the world. Currently, he is the scientific, scientific coordinator of the Horizon 2020 project, EULAC Focus, giving focus to the cultural, scientific, and social dimensions of EU CLAC relations. Uh, he is also uh, he is also president of Observatorio de las Relaciones UE America Latina, UE America Latina, Obreal Global Global, an association with legal personality whose members are 23 institutions of higher education and research from European Union, Latin America, and Middle East. Professor Vera Torstsen is coordinator of the Center for Global Trade and Investments mm -hmm. at the School of Economics, FGV, Sao Paulo. 
He's also coordinator of WTO chair in Brazil. And from 2015 to 2019, Professor Thorstein was president of Cometro, Conmetro's Brazilian Committee on Technical Barriers to Trade. And from 1995 to 2010, she was she acted as economic advisor to the Brazilian mission at the WTO in Geneva. Finally, he was also professor of foreign trade policies at the master level at the ELPO Barcelona, Science Po Paris, and EEA Lisbon. So, uh, Professor Ramon, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, it is a pleasure uh, finding again old friends, uh, Vera Torstensen in, in particular. There have been a few years we have not uh, met. And I'll begin by saying that I had PowerPoints, but for this occasion I have prepared one because this was suggested to me. So let me share my screen and see whether this works. It seems it works. <clears throat> uh, let me begin with the approach of my presentation. I don't know the answer to the effects of COVID-19 on regional integration. So maybe what I should have done is to decline your kind invitation, saying, I, I, I don't know. And I don't know for two reasons. The first is because the COVID-19 pandemic and crisis is still unfolding. And uh, nobody knows how and when it will end. And so the consequences it can have. The second reason is because a lot of the effects, uh, most of the effects of the COVID-19 on regional integration depends on the reaction of politicians and of the world of politics to COVID. And as you know better than me, because you are in Brazil, uh, these effects are completely unpredictable. And the reaction of politicians to this is unpredictable. This is why uh, I have decided, instead of giving an answer, giving elements to frame the answer. Uh, the PowerPoint uh, gives a synthesis of this frame. Uh, it's very simple. I repeat that I hate PowerPoints. So it's very simple, but it can be helpful. And my presentation has two parts. The first, is presenting an analytical framework I designed around a bit less than 20 years ago for a project for the uh, Inter-American Development Bank on regional integration. And that has been uh, proven fruitful, in particular for courses and postgraduate uh, courses. So, the analytical framework, and then I will apply the analytical framework to some thinking or guide for thinking for the COVID crisis. The analytical framework is very simple. And in fact, I have discovered that even if I thought it uh, for regional integration, it applies, in fact, to any policy because it distinguishes four elements the preconditions on which uh, the policy is built on, the objectives that orient it, the instruments that are used, and the dimensions. The dimensions because any social problem uh, occurs in a multidimensional space in which you must consider different dimensions. You see how this works. On preconditions, I insist I'm now presenting the framework and then I will apply it to our topic. 
on preconditions, the issue is to choose the relevant ones. Everyone can imagine plenty, hundreds of preconditions having an effect on a social phenomenon, because in society, everything is linked to society. Uh, everything is linked to everything. So uh, you can uh, find uh, relations between everything. You must choose the preconditions and which are the relevant ones for the problem in hand. If you analyze a policy, some preconditions will be more important than another. And if you analyze another policy, other preconditions must uh, be found as uh, relevant. This is very important for regional integration, I advise, because many people, in particular European preachers of the evangel of European integration in Latin America, which is a, a group of people that frankly have been very harmful in the world, and in particular in Latin America, try to discuss regional integration in Latin America without considering that the preconditions there are completely different from the ones that existed in Europe in the, in the 50s. The second element of the analytical framework is the definition of objectives. Definition by practitioners or definition by people who study the development of regional integration. And here, the essential recommendation is not a long list. A long list of objectives means necessarily simply because of the limits existing for policy design and policy implementation, lack of focus, and dispersion of efforts. When you have a good set of objectives for a policy, be it of regional integration or another, you must define one or two, at most, main political ones, and then a short set of intermediate ones that have two characteristics. First, make sense in themselves because they are objectives so that you have to achieve and to achieve in order to conceive, to attain something, but that are also steps or instrumental to the main one. And concerning instruments, Every policy has its instruments. In terms of regional integration, I consider that there are four main instruments, uh, legal rules, which are extremely important, in particular in processes of regional integration that are meant to build built on legal foundations. Then common activities, things to be done together, from the agricultural policy in the a framework of the old economic, uh, European economic community to any, for example, pro program of grants uh, to be implemented at regional level uh, for uh, students. The third instrument is budgetary redistribution. I say budgetary because all policies involve redistribution. But here I'm referring to putting together money and then redistributing this money uh, differently from the way the money has arrived to the common uh, fund. And the fourth, of course, diplomatic activities. That is to say, in the sense of the old diplomacy, with digital or not digital means, that means talking, writing, discussing, uh, trying to convince. And these diplomatic activities have their limits, but of course are active and can be useful. And concerning the dimensions, I distinguish four dimensions. The first, these dimensions, you can give more importance to the one or to the other, but they are there. So you cannot forget them. Uh, the first is clear. Regional integration in one way or the other necessarily means a way of inserting the states participating in the regional integration process in the world. So they must have some sort of external dimension. When I say some sort, means some sort. There can be very different parts to 
regional integration. Uh, the process is not unidimensional or unidirectional, but the external dimension is there. The second dimension, content. Content. Uh, what is it about? Uh, which are the policies that are put together or are harmonized or are made interdependent? This is the material content of the process. The third is a strength. The process, uh, in order to be politically meaningful, must be strong, must have some capacity to act on society. And this capacity to act and have effects on society depends if the process has a legal foundation on the strength on the law, which can be questionable. Uh, you are in Mercosur, and you understand perfectly well when I'm talking about the strength or the lack of strength of uh, regional law, but it depends also on politics, because law is not everything, and there can be a sense of uh, political uh, interdependence well accepted by the governments, and you know better than me the history of Mercosur uh, from uh, to, uh, 1991 up to now, and you can perfectly well distinguish also different phases in terms of strength. And the fourth, of course, is the existence of more or less flexibility and capacity of adaptation, because regional integration has been invented in some moment and is developing along the time. So you must see whether it is flexible or not. On that basis, what I will do very briefly is use this analytical framework in order to analyze the effects of uh, COVID-19 on preconditions. Here, I think that the situation is clear and uh, uh, se abra before Ademar uh, talked into this direction that the preconditions of regional integration do not change radically or even as likely with COVID-19. Uh, if we take as a reference, uh, it's my obligation as a European, the European economic process, the preconditions have not changed in 2020. The preconditions have changed well before. They changed with the first 25 years of the European Economic Community. It changed, they changed during the period 85-2000, the period of the disintegration of the uh, Soviet bloc and the uh, problem of what to do or how to face it and after 2000. And to be, to point to one specific point, the precondition changed because with enlargement, the member states that before had some sense of community were enlarged to countries that entered in the European Union. This we can discuss, and I have discussed it later, not as a result of any strategy, but as a strategy by default, because the uh, uh, Western Europe didn't know what to do with the disintegration of the Soviet bloc. And finally, what happened was uh, enlarging the European Union, and this was a change of preconditions. The preconditions existed in the 50s, and the preconditions existing in 2000 and in 2010 and in 2020 whether with COVID or without COVID, are completely different. So, as they are completely different, and the process has not adapted sufficiently, uh, we must already begin to understand that the process is in a permanent crisis. But the crisis is not because of COVID. The crisis is because in the radical change of preconditions between the moment in which the process was conceived until the moment in which it is implemented, as it is now. What about the objectives? That's very clear. In the first 25 years, 
of European integration from the middle 50s to the middle 80s or to the beginning of the 80s, the objective was clear. There was a main overriding political objective, uh, trying to favor some long-lasting peace in a region of the world that have uh, bloodied uh, uh, all the world, and in particular Europe, and that had experienced collective and prolonged periods of collective hunger, trying to bring peace to this through economic cooperation, through building a customs union with some internal policies, mainly an agricultural one. And this, whether we like the policies or not, uh, worked. So that at the beginning of the 80s, the homework had been done. For once uh, in the life, this objective, very modest, because this was an objective that mm, had nothing to do with how the world was developing. Uh, it was completely passive and non-active to the Cold War. Uh, it had been uh, thought of together with colonialism, something that the Europeans don't like to be reminded of, but that we have to take into account. But these objectives were no longer possible after 1985. So, what are the objectives of the process? My answer is, I don't know, because I think that nobody knows. Uh, if you want to think critically about this, read the uh, conclusions of the Lisbon European Council in 2000, in which you will read, I quote, the main objective is to make Europe the knowledge-based economy more dynamic in the world for 2010. No comment. No comment. Uh, of course, in 2010, some new objective had to be invented. And in 2020, it seems that the new objective is the European Green Deal and uh, making the European Union the leader of the fight against climatic change. In my opinion, the situation is clear. Uh, there is a problem with the objectives. Again, this is not COVID. This is an extractional uh, problem. Um, answering the question of the objectives requires answering two very difficult questions. One is relatively easy. The preconditions have changed, which are the objectives that can be found in new preconditions. But the second is extremely interesting politically. In order to define objectives, you need an act, a political act. What Antonio Gramsci said, un intellectuale organico. And where is the intellectuale organico able to define new objectives for the European Union? But, allow me, I leave the question to Vera. I would ask, where are the intellectuale organici in Mercosur or in South America or in Latin America to think about a set of object objectives when those that guided the process in 1991, when the Tratado de Asunción was signed, are no longer uh, working. And so now to the instruments. COVID. Effects of COVID and the pandemic on the European Union or other regional integration processes. A new common activity, a regional health policy. Here I have to remind you that in the case of the European Union, this is impossible. It's impossible because the treaty forbids it. There is an article in the treaty on education, on health, on culture, that is very long, but the only meaningful part 
of the article is the last two lines in which it says, to the exception of any harmonization of legal or administrative rules. If the European Union does not have the competence to legislate in the area of health, how can it develop a regional health policy? A new set of rules. It's very difficult, a uh, new set of rules on, on, on what? More diplomatic activities. Certainly, there will be plenty of meetings at all levels talking about uh, everything, uh, including COVID. But are diplomatic activities enough for this? Deepening budgetary redistribution. The budget of the European Union is already full of commitments. It's very difficult to change the role. Identifiable effects on other policies. Frankly, I don't know. Think about you. This is an analytical framework to frame your thinking and to frame your possible answers. On instruments, yes, there is a clear, identifiable new instrument that would be the great novelty of COVID, but in conditional, because we don't know. The European Union didn't have the slightest possibility of getting in debt, except for a very minimum uh, exception that is not there. But now, after the European Council a few months ago, it was decided by a very strange way that if needed, I can explain uh, later on, to open this possibility of the European Union issuing bonds. But this is a possibility that had to be this, this implemented uh, by a very complicated mechanism that we don't know yet whether it will work or not. If the envisaged issuing of EU bonds took finally take place with the excuse or on the occasion of the uh, COVID crisis, that would be really the greatest and by far the most important effect of COVID on the European regional integration process. However, we must wait and see. The news from today, from the press review one receives, is that the European Commission is thinking about more or less getting the same money, but not through the same instrument. So the novelty of the instruments would no longer be there. But it seems this would be the really the greatest novelty. And on the dimensions, the external dimension. Yes, here there could be a, a, a novelty, but it depends on whether regional integration is adequately inserted in the global context and in the world of international organizations. And I can leave this to Vera to, to discuss. But the fact is that regional integration and the multilateral system and the United Nations system continues to be two different animals and two different levels of policy action. So it is not clear that what happens internally in any integration process because of COVID will really have an effect on the external dimension of the regional integration process. Of course, if there are regional policies and actions, uh, new ones undertaken with the occasion of COVID, that would imply an increasing content and would be a proof of flexibility and capacity of adaptation. But is this the case? Will this happen? Will this increase in content that at the same time would be a proof of flexibility and capacity of adaptation 
really uh, take place. Not up to now. Up to now, uh, it has been rather the contrary. Uh, at the level of European integration, and I think of regional integration in general, rather, uh, it has been a process of less integration than of more integration. Uh, um, frontiers that were without uh, border controls uh, have now seen the reappearance of border controls, restrictions of movement. So, uh, rather the answer would be less than not more. And final point on strength. Of course, if there was a positive and effective answer of regional integration to the COVID crisis, this would strengthen enormously at least the relationship between the citizens and the rulers. But here we have a danger, and it is that if this is not the case, and this regional uh, response to COVID does not take place, the crisis of the regional integration process can broaden and deepen because once again, uh, citizens will discover or at least will feel that regional integration is very far from their everyday needs and their, uh, their everyday wishes. So here we have a danger because failure to respond adequately to COVID is not neutral. Failure increases the disbelief in regional integration that is more or less extending in Europe, but not only in Europe, if I look to Latin America. So my advice at the end of the presentation is uh, if this analytical framework, you find it helpful to frame your thinking, I will be very happy. Uh, in any case, uh, it is up to you to try to find uh, the answer. Uh, my only uh, hope was to bring some elements for you to better frame and to better organize your thing. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Torrent. I'm now passing the floor to Vera Torstesen to make her presentation. Thank you very much for this very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, now, I hope it's going to work. First of all, thank you very much for the invitation. Ramon, it's a pleasure, a huge pleasure to, to have you uh, with us and with other friends of uh, USP. Uh, I certainly I'm going to reflect some of the, 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 the points of Ramon because he was very kind to send me the presentation before. So a, a little bit, I try to to see the new context and see, uh, and to, to, to a little bit to reflect on uh, what he said. Now, uh, what's going on in the area of uh, regional integration, right? What I can say is, first of all, take a look and see if, uh, before going to regional and talk about trade, take a look what's going on around the world. And here you have a lot of change. And this is COVID related and not COVID related. Take what's going on on WHO. What's going on there? It's amazing. Hamon, how can they kill it, the organization, in the, set, in the way they kill it? Not kill it in the sense of uh, destroy, destroying the organization, but put it in the, in the completely blocked way. And now, for the first thing that's going on is that we have news that uh, things are changing in Geneva, right? And why it's so important? Because WHO uh, offers the basis for uh, rules to trade. What's going on IMF? Uh, how IMF is allowed to, 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 um, uh, to let countries to do things that they not agree uh, at all before? What's going on on investment? What will be the impact of all this on investment and finance? And uh, for Brazil, Ramon, it's really important, OECD. Uh, uh, we see, it's, uh, I say that, uh, 
OECD is a, is a organization that Brazil is uh, fighting for to be to be to integrated, and this will change a lot the, the quality of uh, uh, public policy in Brazil. And then you have the whole. This is new. Uh, how environment and sustainability is going to affect trade? And to tell the truth, I think this is the main issue that is blocking the agreement between the European Union and uh, the the Mercosur. And the new issue, human rights, right? Because we cannot talk about uh, what's going on. Uh, if you go to the next uh, uh, point is, what are the big trends now after COVID or in, uh, inside the COVID uh, pandemics? The first and I think the good news is that the US is back. Is back to, in the sense, to de-block WHO, uh, to get again uh, with the help the, the, well, the wealth organization, the World Health Organization, the Paris Agreement, and what I think is uh, what the, the United States uh, are, uh, is going to do with integration. What we are doing here in the center is a lot of research, trying to compare all these agreements and see the regulation to see what's going on. Because if there are, there are no new rules in WHO, where are the forum? And the forum is that certainly the, the preferential arrangements. And what is uh, for me is a very positive um, uh, news is that TPP, I don't know the name, so I call it again TPP. Today in the, all the Peterson Institute and all the American institutes, they are talking about that US, because you have the agreement signed already. Uh, and then Mr. Trump on arrive it, just kill it. So the question is what kind of TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership you are going to have, but to have one is a good thing for uh, regional integration. And I, I read a lot of, and this is for, for Ramon, I, I read a lot of things about uh, already in the papers, the European papers that the European Union cannot be, uh, cannot be quiet on this, must react and what's going, what the European Union is going to do. And for me, a kind of atomic, atomic bomb, and Ramon, this is for you, What's going on that is new, completely new, is RCEP. Leaded by China, you have uh, uh, 15 countries that organize the trade rules in a very shallow way. That is, they are not talking about Japan and Australia, ask them to put service and uh, climate digital. But if you go to the agreement, what you see is a very, very uh, simple agreement putting order in the bilateral tariffs and giving a, a kind of written to it. And at the end, in 15 more, for some problems more than this, you are going to have a huge uh, factory Asia, led by China with zero tariffs. And for me, Ramon, you know it, a simple rules of origin, 40%, that's it. One paper, one paper. So for me, what's going on that is new, a revolution, uh, COVID or not COVID related, is RCEP. And because of RCEP, you are going to change the whole, the whole, the whole system of trade and integration. And then, come on, you have the, the agreements held by European Union, and let us see what's going to, 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 ha to, to happen, right? And the reaction in WTO. Now, uh, this is a thing that I, 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 want, I really like to talk is about, forget about, you have the old issue of tariff, but now, and some rules, and now you have a lot of rules, and the, the, the most difficult thing to do in integration is, can you put these rules to be a little bit convergent? Because if not, you change tariffs, you put tariffs down, and then you raise there's a number of uh, 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 regulatory barriers, and then you put uh, integration, uh, you kill it at all. Uh, and I'm talking about what? Technical barriers, sanitary, phytosanitary, environment. Look, uh, this, this can be a huge barrier. And then you have all the other uh, traditional issues on integration, right? Uh, and then the impact, what's going to happen to value change? Oh, and I was two days ago uh, watching a, a seminar in the WHO, a lot of research being done on what's happened with the COVID and the value chains. Well, they just, they change a little bit, but not too much because of the costs involved. 
And yes, the big, the big multinationals are trying to diversify a little bit, but it's not such a huge consequence as we expected before, right? Uh, again, you are going to have to discuss the new WHO and to face the new megas, the new mega agreements, right? The issues I told you a little bit before are not new, certainly digital economy, uh, environment and labor standards, and anti-corruption and currency. Currency is a, is a very funny issue to see how the US is uh, going on with the fight with China on devaluation, right? And this is here to, to, to bring a bit again the numbers of countries in this uh, TPP and the new TTIP, if we have a new one, uh, and RCEP and the amount of GDP and goods and service exports that face them. And I love this graphic to see, look how more for Africa. Look TPP and TTIP, so a huge amount of trade and GDP and so, so, so few countries if you compare with the rest. And then go to RCEP. India is not there. But India discussed it a lot, and last time decided not to, last uh, issue, uh, minutes decided not to join. But again, you see, this is what I call uh, Asia fabric. That is uh, a very low tariff and, a low, and very, very uh, easy rules of origin. And this impact to be huge for India and for the other countries, right? And this is new for our world. And then let me talk about Latin America. And this is a thing that give me some a lot of uh, um, preoccupation. Look, you see again, Hamo, and look again how to use your framework. What we have in Latin America, Chile, with a lot of agreements, the other countries with a lot of agreements, and Brazil and Argentina, with Mercosul only, completely out of these modern worlds. What you have with Mercosul, some products, only a few ones, 500, uh, with India and uh, something with Asia, but no agreements at all. A lot of negotiation. Look at the, 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 the countries. It's, this is was to, to the, 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 this government, the, the new government, and because this is a kind of ideological uh, uh, a, 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 a policy decided by the, the Lula and Dilma government, only to have agreements with developing countries. Now you have a new agreement, an assess a new, a new understanding, a new policy, say, okay, let's go uh, to discuss with Canada, Mexico again, and some countries in Asia, uh, Asian countries, and let us talk about Korea and Japan. This is completely new. And I love this, this figure because it shows us that Merkel Sul is completely out. All, of, all countries in the Pacific, uh, Latin America, with a lot of agreements, and Mercosul only with the European Union. So it's amazing how we, how can we, uh, Ramon, using your framework to explain why uh, we are so in the bad shape. Uh, the, the first part of conclusion is that Brazil is out of RTAs, Brazil is out of new rules of trade, because these are what's going on. Brazil has only WHO as a forum for negotiation, WHO is stuck. Uh, Brazil has no trade partnership, uh, not trade uh, with BRICS. BRICS is not India and China is not for trade and is uh, losing uh, South America to China. Amor, I'm studying a lot the investment of China in Latin America and it's amazing what's going on in terms of quietly China is investing a lot in all countries, Argentina and Brazil mainly. So the question is, uh, and I love this also, the US, you have a lot of influence from the US in the Pacific uh, area of South America. And uh, I'm saying that China is redefining Tordesillas, you know, it's dividing the countries among us. Uh, if you go to the little bit of economics, you are going to see that the big impact, if we have agreements, Brazil with the US, European Union, you have a lot of gains in the dynamic simulations, but you have a very huge impact on, on GDP if you go to TTIP and TPP without Brazil changing uh, this kind of discussion. This is to, to bring a little bit of, uh, to, to say, explain, and Ramon, look, 
Brazil has a really tariff, very low tariffs for agriculture products. If you see the black, the, uh, the, the yellow and green uh, against the emergent countries and you see how Brazil is protected. Here's the point, Ramon. Brazil is so protective, the tariff so huge, and this is Mercosul tariff, that Argentina and Mercosul, they decided to be protectionist and not to, uh, 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 to work around the world. And this is the thing for the first time with the agreement of uh, European Union. You we are going to, to have to face it, right? I, I leave the, the lot of tariffs for you. And I, I, I'd like to finish with the new barriers that I told about is regulatory barriers. If you, discuss, if you cut tariffs, and then you raise the technical issue. And mm -hmm. if you raise the phytosanitary uh, 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 exigence, Ramon, we do not have a kind of Cassis de Dijon uh, decision, remember, that if not killing the Germans are not going to kill the, the French. In, in, uh, it, it is the basis for the, 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 the acceptance of all these regulatory rules in Europe. And we do, don't have it. To, to tell the truth, in the automobile sector, still now, Argentina is not accepting the, the, the standards for automobiles in Brazil and vice versa. Automobiles is not included in Mercosul, but they are 50% the of our trade between uh, Argentina and Brazil. So I agree with you, you do not have political objectives, you do not have the political strength to put order in this kind of issue. And look for the number of uh, technical barriers uh, notified to the WTO. <coughs> look at the numbers of F uh, FTS. I could spend hours talking about, about this. And look at the numbers, 30,000 are the rules notified to WTO, uh, mandatory rules that you have to follow before exporting to, to, to other countries, right? And these rules, are not international in this sense. And this is a failure of WHO. US and the, the European Union, they, they do not like the same uh, basic international organization. US does not accept uh, um, ISO. Uh, and then you have uh, for SPS, for sanitary, phytosanitary, yes, you have a codex, more or less, this is international. And for me, the worst thing is that Ramon, the European Union privatized environment sustainability standards because the European Union cannot uh, do this because they, they cannot accept one kind of a standard. They decided to ask for the, the NGOs, the non-governmental organizations, tell us what you want. And then they, you, the, the community give a lot of money to them. And now what we have, we have a huge number on sustainability standards, private, private standards, completely out of the range of WHO. And this can be really uh, uh, have a huge impact on uh, export. Look at this, and I, I study all of them. You have to pay for the European certification. You have to, to, to ask for the Europeans how to, be, to transform your farm, to be a sustainable farm, and so on. And come on, but at the end, with the new objective of the, the European Union, we are going to have a deal that is a green deal. This is going to work. And Brazil is changing, come on, a lot about deforestation, a lot of how to, to, to treat the farms, pesticides, and so on, because the impact of this sustainability standard, private ones, but they are really working and changing export from Brazil. And uh, okay, I talk about it. Look at the numbers, they are still there. You have a huge amount and now they are more or less this, around 400. And the last conclusion is regional integration is here again, because I don't think to the, a, a kind of uh, reaction to the, what China did for the US and for uh, Europe. Uh, I fully agree that WTO must be a, a first actor on this. Uh, preferential arrangements are where we have the new rules. Come on, if you study the agreements, you have a lot of interesting things to study. And for me, the most important issue, and I have no idea how to solve this, 
is how to put a regulatory issue on the, the, the same kind of screen. So with this, I finish my presentation and to conclude, I will say, Ramon, you help us because in, for Latin America, we lost the objectives because we try to, to go uh, deeper integration, but we cannot finish the first level of integration. The question is, can we move to service and digital and so on and let goods for the end? I don't know, right? Uh, and uh, the, 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 a point that for me is really worrying is that Brazil and Argentina, because of Mercosul, are completely out of uh, uh, the, the big scenario. Uh, so now we are going to have some time for some questions and answers. Please, everyone that wants to make any kind of uh, question or new issues, please raise the hand. At Can the I start raising questions to Ramon? <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, Ramon, tell me, what do you think about the reaction of the European Union to what China is doing in uh, it, with Reset. Do you feel any reaction or they are going to stop the, this, uh, the, the, politic, the policy of uh, increasing the number of uh, regional arrangements to, to negotiate? Let me, uh, Vera, thanks. Let me, try, let me try to answer your question, but first, let me introduce a, a, an idea, which I think can bring all of us in agreement, but that must be set by someone. From a policy perspective, the history of the last 50 years, more, 60, has been uh, the following. First, there was decolonization. This must be emphasized because when in Europe, uh, this is true, you address an audience and you talk about colonization, you see people looking in all directions saying colonization, what is this? Does this have something to do with us? And when you explain to them that this monument to peace, the European community was built by the same political class, basically the French one, who were involved in the, in the China war and in the Algeria war, people get extremely confused. So there was the colonization, but for the colonization to be effective, really, we had to wait for 40 years. Because even now there are remainings of colonization, but for 50 years. And now in Europe, uh, if you have a sense of humor, it's extraordinary because you hear, for example, um, sentences like this. Oh, these Indians, these Indians, I don't understand them. In the WTO, they look for themselves. Hell, what are they looking for? Or should they still look for uh, Britain as in this uh, uh, series in TV, The Crown, that you should see because it's very amusing? No, India now looks for itself. And Africa looks for itself, most of it, and this has changed the politics of globalization. Of course, and digitalization, and um, the increase in the productivity of labor, and new industries, and knowledge, and knowledge economies, okay. Politically, colonization finally, finally has come to an end. Second process, together with the end of colonization, because it was some kind of overlapping, Asia become the more important region in the world. Of course, of course, 
see, most of mankind lives there, of course. Uh, and I would suggest to, to Ademar, I was listening to him before, of course, that the first time I heard Koreans, people from the Korean Development Institute, one of the best think tanks in the world, I perfectly noticed that they never talk about the emergence of China. They always talk about the re-emergence of China. <laughs> of course, because China had been for centuries the more important country in the world. Something that we tend to forget. So these are the prolegomenon to the answer to your question. The problem in Europe in general, and in the European Union, and in member states in the European Union, and the problem with President Macron, and the problem with the European Commission, is that they have not yet metabolized these two political facts that I have mentioned. Very often in Europe, they continue to discuss, as is the center of the world, was between Paris and Berlin. Imagine, how can they understand how the world is going? And I forgot one. Uh, and you hear diplomats, very well-formed experts in Europe saying, I am very afraid of what the Chinese I do are doing because this is very imperialistic. Extraordinary. The Chinese investing all around the world, this is very... Uh, imperialistic. I, I always ask the question, and how many genocides have they produced compared to the genocides that we Europeans have produced? <laughs> That's the problem. Because I think that the problem in, uh, in political terms, uh, now uh, I have nearly forgotten what I knew about our trade uh, uh, agreements, Vera. Uh, you are not, you have always been much better than I, and I have nearly forgotten. But in political in political terms, uh, the problem is that this is because I have referred to the intellectual organic, the, the Gramsci. Uh, uh, if you don't know what he means, please read Gramsci. That it is still worthwhile. Is that who thinks? about all this. And when I say who think, we are here in a seminar organized by one of the best, probably the best and more prestigious university uh, in Latin America. I'm not referring only to politicians. I'm referring to academics and to researchers and to intellectuals. Who is able to rethink the world? as it is now uh, being. Uh, do, uh, I will ask you uh, a, a question if um, Professor Bourguignon is here, because he's a mathematician, but we are more or less, let's say, social scientists. Do you think, Jean-Pierre, that if I write an article explaining this that I'm explaining now, this article will receive a good peer review by my peers? Will it be published in a prestigious journal of those that serve to uh, advance in your career? And the answer, Jean-Pierre, is no. No, because this is a heterodox. And as it is heterodox, this is dangerous. And as it is dangerous, it uh, better not to have it published. And as it is not published, it is dangerous. Of course, politicians continue as usual. And here is my answer, better, as usual, as usual. But I fear that here in Brazil will be the same as usual. And let's hope that uh, Biden still has some inspiration from time to time from Obama, who probably is the only one who is able to think a bit differently than uh, what people were thinking before. Uh, so this, uh, it sounds pessimistic, 
Yes, it is. It, it is pessimistic because for having a new policy, there must be people thinking about the new policy. And it's the lack of thinking that worries me. Uh, to put it another way, if I have not been clear, uh, when people criticize politicians, we all do, all the time, it's our favorite again. I tend to think that we, as a community, we, social scientists, are much more to be criticized than politicians because we have been unable to rethink uh, the world. Maybe it would be better that we forget about peer reviews and we read directly, not secondhand, uh, Ricardo, Adam Smith, Marx, and Weber, and that would be much better than not publishing articles in journals. Okay, it seems that there is no other question, but I have a question for you both. It seems to me, yes, it seems to me that uh, we have, uh, excuse me, Janina, do you want to no, talk? No, Professor Eduardo Viola has oh, a question. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I didn't see, see that. Please, Professor Eduardo Viola, the floor is yours. Um. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, both for excellent presentations. I have a question that is related to the possibilities of, of uh, ratification of the Mercosur European Union uh, Treaty. Uh, what is in the, uh, the, the public debate generally is related to the obstacles related to the environmental and Amazonian policy in Brazil, okay? But I haven't seen much, much debate about the Argentinian situation in which Argentina is today in a track that is completely out of opposite, I would say, to what is what are the basics of a market economy. Uh, and so uh, the question is the following. What, what supposing that uh, the obstacle of Brazil uh, environmental policy is overcome, overcome. That is a big if for the next two years. Uh, uh, what would happen with Argentina? It, it would be needed to, uh, to sign a new treaty excluding Argentina, for example, or it would be possible to ratify uh, the treaty, even if Argentina is uh, out of the rules of the treaty. Thank you very much. Can I, I'll give my, my uh, an answer and Hamo can react on this. First, my uh, own opinion on this is that the pressure on, uh, uh, on Brazil is clear. Uh, we have a good article of the ambassador of the European Union in, uh, in the papers and a lot of interviews that the big concern is about uh, environment and, uh, and, um, and, uh, and uh, the Amazon. <coughs> and you see, Eduardo, how people, are, uh, the, the big business is reacting. And more important than this, you see that fin the financial institutions are deeply involved in environment now. Why? It's not because the banks here in Brazil are green, they are not the bankers, but because they are not going to get money from abroad if they not react to environment issues. So the financial system and the exporters are pushing a lot uh, the, the, the government to change their position with Amazon. Now, so I think, and I'm convinced that the, that there's a lot of uh, interest in uh, other sectors. Uh, you have already letters from the other sectors saying the agreement's good. And again, uh, uh, the, the economy in, Germ in, in uh, Europe is not so, 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 uh, so, so good. Now, for Argentina, uh, it is true that the agreement can be signed by parts, can be a partial agreement. So if at the, the end of the, this uh, uh, road, uh, Argentina said, I, I, we do not want to, to go further on the integration and so on, this can be a little bit like uh, negotiated in the sense that we are partial agreement. This is what the information I have. 
So I don't know if the Europeans are going to, to accept this or not. But uh, again, uh, this should be uh, not for now, certainly, but for the near future. What, but what is important, uh, Eduardo, is that things are moving in the sense that uh, uh, exporters are worried about. They are following my, my, my voluntary standards. They are a reflection on this. And there's a lot of um, uh, barriers now for uh, exports of any kind of wood, not certified uh, uh, wood. And again, things are changing, but uh, I cannot answer uh, the, your concern about Argentina, right? I think that uh, if the, at the end of the, this period, Argentina decide to, to ask for more time, this will, will happen, right? Thank you. Uh, uh, How yes, uh, uh, Eduardo, first. Uh, is it true that we met a few years ago in Brussels? Yes, it is. Okay, okay. So my aging neurons continue to, Put your face to on age. By uh, uh, still, I remember. So happy to meet you. Uh, listen, on this question of the entry to force of the agreement with Mercosur, a few months ago, I have a very interesting and long exchange with our common friend, Vera Roberto Bosi. And uh, because there was a lot of misunderstandings in Argentina about uh, provisional application or not ratification, so on. But at the end, I ask a question that I ask also all of you. Uh, at the time, the articles, the text of the articles on signature and entry into force were not public, which was extraordinary because, again, this is a criticism to all of us. People were discussing about something that nobody knew because the articles were not there. I don't know whether they are there now because I can imagine what the articles say, but these articles can say very different things on entering to force together on parts, provisional application or whatever. But please, my advice again with a smile is please be empirical. Instead of discussing, look at the articles and in all likelihood, the articles will tell you What's the situation? Uh, a few week, a few months ago, everyone was discussing that for sure was discussing about this, and the articles were not public. I knew them because a very good friend, negotiator for Argentina, had given the text to me, but had given the text to me under promise of confidentiality, as I have not been uh, freed from this promise of confidentiality, officially, I don't know what the articles say. And I have not looked at the texts that are published. Please don't do it now, because now we are in the seminar. But when the seminar is over, go to internet, look for the text of the agreement, and look at whether the articles are there or not. And then we'll see. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Uh, I, I have a question for you, Sue. Uh, my, my question is related to Africa and also to part of, of uh, South America. In one of the maps that uh, Vera showed to us, it seems that there are a lot of connections linking Europe, Asia, countries and some of the Latin American countries, but there are a large number of countries in Africa, Africa as a whole, and in, also in Latin America, that are out of the main negotiations and agreements outside, let's say, the, the EU-Mercosur uh, agreement. But these countries that are out are very important from this, from the from the environmental perspectives. And do you think that these general connections that are being built and rebuilt now 
could have effects on, on the policies, environmental policies in these countries that are out of these negotiations? Look, uh, I, 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 some time ago, I studied that the, all the agreements uh, from the European Union to Africa and from the NEAGOA, the initiatives of the United States to, to, to Africa. The European, the European agreements, yes, they have environment clauses, and since the beginning, uh, Lomé agreements and so on, they are really worried about the logs of the forest and so on. And, and a lot of uh, social clothes also, not the other the American ones. So uh, what I put in the graphics is that to, to highlight only TTIP and TPP, but uh, you have, uh, yes, agreements. But if you go to the numbers, the numbers are very small. You know, the exports from Africa to the United States, if you take out uh, oil, and um, it's, not, it's, it's not there. And I agree with you, the initiatives of integration in Africa and Latin America, in the sense, uh, they are not connected in this world. And you have now what I call in, in regional chains or value chains, you have the, the United States chain, the fabric, US fabric, the US Germany or European Union fabric and Asia fabric. And it's true, Latin America and Africa are out. That's it. Only a couple of uh, comments and information on my side. Um, uh, Opreal Global, now it's global because it is working in particular in and with Africa. So I begin to learn a bit about Africa. Africa signed a few years ago and it enters into force and was applied a few months ago. Uh, an agreement named African Continental uh, trade uh, uh, agreement that is a sort of regional integration for the whole continent at the inside of which there are regional economic communities. For me, what, what matters and what is worrying and interesting from the perspective of poor or the poorest countries in Latin America is that it seems that maybe nobody knows exactly why, Africa is growing quite a lot economically. Uh, this, if it happens, is very important because Africa is not extremely populated. In fact, it has uh, 1,300 million people, that is to say uh, the same as India or China, where it's much smaller, but it's very, very big. I always say to my students, look at the world, not in maps that distort the uh, surfaces, but in uh, uh, a glob, a globus of the, of the world. If you look at the world in the globus of the world, you'll see how big is Africa. It's, it's, it's enormous, much more than you could imagine. So Africa is very important. And what you say about China uh, in countries I know in the Caribbean, for example, that now have China as uh, maybe the more important uh, partner in terms of foreign investment, it is the same in Africa. So uh, if I was Latin America, I would be very worried of this because if Africa continues to grow for a couple of decades, then in the world, South America will be small, will be sparsely populated, and will be less developed than Africa. And if that was the case, it would be very dangerous for Latin America. So I would be uh, extremely interested and worried at what is happening in Africa. But again, the, in the public perception, I'm sure that if you tell uh, from my times when I travel more uh, to Latin America, if you tell to Itamarati, please, 
compare you with Nigeria, they will get very angry, <laughs> very angry. But uh, maybe it, it's worth th thinking uh, uh, about it. I think it must be taken into account. Nobody knows Africa. There are no experts on Africa, but Africa is increasingly important. Okay. Uh, I, it seems that there is no other questions. I would ask uh, Amancio, Professor Amancio, if the if there is an, another question, another issue. Otherwise, we we will finish this session. It was very very interesting to to see the impact of these new changes in the world on regional integration process and collaboration. Yes, I just, thank you. So, uh, just uh, thanks again for the excellent uh, panel and invite everyone for the next one that will be 2 p.m. with the new technology 5G global security change challenges. So thank you very much. See you all later. Thank you. Thank you. At the same at, at the same link, right? Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Professor Ramon. Ramon, can you stay a little bit? <laughs> Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I'm here. Can you, wait, can wait, you wait, use wait, the wait. Zoom from uh, Sarmuski? Sure, sure, <laughs> sure, sure. Go ahead, Vera. Go ahead. Uh, Ramon, vamos lá. Uh, um pouco mais. O que, que você acha da, da, do que a Europa está tá acontecendo com a Europa e, e relação a, a, a... Com a China, eu concordo com você. E agora, com os Estados Unidos, alguma chance de... Uh, uh, listen, as, as we are now, let's say, out, outside the, the, yes. the, the seminar, uh, we can still apply a bit more of central <laughs> The recording has stopped. Okay. <laughs> what Don't is happening? report. Yes. Well, what is happening in Europe, it's very uh, uh, amusing. Because if you ask me, for people who know me, uh, you know that I'm an old-fashioned leftist uh, since I was a, an adolescent. And you ask me, Ramon, what is the reference you can find in Europe from the left? My answer would be, listen, Chancellor Angela Merkel. <laughs> because she is the only one in which I still can find something of the old social democratic Europe. I was much more at the left of this, but that somehow still had something and had learned how to manage capitalism in a civilized way. Uh, in, in Central Europe, uh, in fact, the divergences between social democratic and Christian democrats were not so big. They built the welfare state. And if you say, listen, who is still there from that period? I would say Angela Merkel, at least uh, two or three years ago, she was able to stand up defending the acceptance of refugees. And this is something that for an old-fashioned leftist, you still uh, are very great. This is the type of answer to this. I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I'm very pessimistic on this. When, uh, when uh, Macron was elected, I had a role with my... with my... Uh, French friends from the time I was in the legal service of the council because they were very happy because uh, Marie's, uh, Marina Le Pen had been defeated. And I completely disagree because I said, listen, there was no danger of Marina Le Pen winning the presidential elections. 
But I'm not happy about the ruin of Macron. Why? Because Macron is, in terms of Latin America, the typical leader of a movement. No system of parties. There is Macron and the Macronism. And, and, and you say, listen, and, and this, what has it to do with the good, democratic, old-fashioned Europe? Nothing. Nothing. So what will happen with the United States? I imagine it will depend a lot on Biden and the Biden administration. Uh, my hope is that somehow uh, the WTO will research make an, 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 a new uh, a new uh, phase and in this new phase people will consider that the multilateral system is worthwhile worthwhile I think Vera we should say to all not as an instrument of liberalization but as an instrument for, in order to avoid trade wars. This is always my main message to students. The gut was not invented to liberalize. The gut was invented to prevent trade wars. No discrimination. Uh, in fact, in fact, because people forget this, in fact, even with Trump, even with Trump, somehow, the, 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 the gut uh, being there has been healthy, much helpful that if, not, uh, if it had not been there. And I think that my reaction to, to uh, all this net uh, or web of agreements that you have analyzed, uh, Vera, is because the advantage of these agreements is that uh, I will say now something very heterodox again for economists, is that it makes the international market <coughs> more rigid. And this is an extreme advantage because people think about uh, the market being flexible. Listen, with COVID, we have seen it. The market too flexible means that the crisis never ends. So let's bring some rigidity to the market. And bringing some rigidity to the market creates problems for the one or the other, but exporters interiorize the, these problems, uh, uh, the, learn how to uh, bring the regulation within the, the production and export strategy, and the world goes and goes with the only engine of growth, which is the augmentation in the productivity of labor, which is something that people forget. This is what makes the economies grow. So what happened to <laughs> the European Union, United States? Nobody knows. Uh, listen, it, it's a joke, but the, you know the name of the current um, uh, EU commissioner for trade once the Irish Hogan had to uh, resign? No. <laughs> no. The name is Dombrovsky. Dombrovsky, yes. And uh, he comes, with all due respect, from a Baltic country. Yeah. With all respect, but from a Baltic country. So... Ramon, tell me, UK, what's going to happen at the end? Uh, again, uh, for me, no idea. Brexit, for me, is the typical example of how ignorance is important in explaining political decisions. I guarantee you, I guarantee you that before Two months before the first Brexit agreement was finally signed a year ago, I was convinced that the UK Parliament did not understand a word about what the European Union was. 
not to say Johnson. No idea. No idea. And uh, so now the situation is a situation very strange because um, on the EU side, uh, I don't know whether Barnier uh, knows what he has in his hands because I uh, knew Barnier when I worked in Brussels and I reserved my opinion about him. But the negotiating team of the commission, they know. These are guys that are professional and they know. But uh, at the top level in the United Kingdom, Johnson and his advisors, they don't know. And the best proof is that when Brexit was signed, the alternative before, it was clear, the alternative was not Brexit or not Brexit or Brexit with an agreement. The alternative was no Brexit or Brexit with controls at the borders between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland or Brexit with border controls between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. And this continues to be the situation now because there will be border controls yes. in one place or the other. Uh, one can make something very strange and can um, separate Northern Ireland from Great Britain. But either border controls in one place or in the other. And this, I think, is not accepted. In particular, Vera, because uh, who is paid and able to keep his job or her job as an advisor? If he goes to Boris Johnson and say, listen, Prime Minister, I will explain this clearly to you because you have not understood what is going on. And the alternative is this or this. He will get fired or she will get fired. So people continue to talk uh, with uh, words that are not... Uh, <laughs> and, and, and this goes on. And uh, these uh, is, are very complex situations, but very complex situations that in order to understand the details, first, you must understand the essential point. Once you have understood the essential point, then you can go to the details. And uh, because uh, it, it's very complicated. But if you do not see clearly the point, and the point with Brexit has always seen this. I sent uh, a draft. Uh, if I find it in my email, I will send it to you. Uh, one day, uh, around two years ago, I decided that I have to... Uh, uh, be uh, responsible. And I said, listen, Ramon, you will send uh, a letter to the Financial Times uh, explaining the real uh, uh, options with Brexit. And I sent the letter. Of course, it was not published because the letter implicitly was also a criticism of them. Uh, shouldn't the Financial Times have explained two or three years ago, <laughs> that the only alternative was no Brexit, Brexit with borders in Ireland, <coughs> or Brexit with borders between Northern Ireland and the United Kingdom, that would have clarified a lot the situation. So, I, I don't know. <coughs> I don't know. I don't know. Well, <laughs> I hope we have opportunities to, <coughs> to, to talk uh, a little bit more another time. Yeah. Time to go to your lunch and uh, yes. to... So, uh, it has been a pleasure. Oh. Sorry for uh, talking too much, but no, uh, I, to. I, 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 I was invited for this. Sure. Also, so, and I send, I send, I we start talking about in the in the <laughs> by you and by WhatsApp. Thank you very cool. much. Bye bye. Uh, so bye bye. Thank you, Vera. Thank you. Uh, See you later. Bye. See you later. Bye bye.